Inner Lion Media. Heaven meets earth, when people strive for greater understanding, when myth and legend are understood to be real and life-changing, when people become materially exhausted, unrequited, hopeless and isolated within themselves, at that darkest hour blossoms the flower of innate spirituality. As we ride in this soul car of the material body, it is to be understood that we are so much more than this clockwork combination of earth, water, fire, air, and ether in which we travel through time and space. While admittedly an exquisite machine, the material body is limited by the ever-present, seemingly unconquerable scourges of birth, death, disease and old age upon the wandering, hungry soul. When one truly understands that they are not this body, but instead reside temporarily within its manifest combination of elements, only to expand their evolutionary jurisdiction and intimate understanding, then blossoms the flower of innate spirituality. When knowledge arises, that mortal man is in fact an eternal, spiritual, qualitative spark of the unlimited divine fire of God, and that there is, from the very first moment of time, struck a long and loving relationship between the Creator and the created, then surely blossoms the flower of innate spirituality. Here is the opportunity, and now is the hour to dive deeper than we have ever done into the wondrous realm of the ever-expanding field of divine consciousness. A singular chance to understand and embrace our real birthright of Sat, Chit, Ananda, or eternity, knowledge, and bliss ever-increasing and everlasting. It has long been said that sound vibration is a bridge between heaven and earth, and to marry that power to the wisdom of the ages is perhaps the strongest connection made between mortal man and the gods above us. Welcome then, brothers and sisters, to a unique collection of ancient but also inspired contemporary thought on the true nature of our existence here within this wondrous material realm and beyond. This is your ticket to transcendence. A singular opportunity to fly free, soaring to places unknown but deeply felt. A means of intimate connection and liberating power. This is the Yoga Secrets Series. Krishna is a Sanskrit word that means all-attractive. The name Krishna conveys the full meaning of God because God is all-attractive. He is full of all opulences. In this world, we're attracted by a person who's very rich, famous, highly educated, beautiful. 
These are features of attraction, and when all these qualities are reposed in one person without any rival, that person is God. Unless God is all attractive, how can he be God? Krishna has all these opulences in full, and that is the full definition of God. Our process for understanding Krishna and coming closer to him is to chant his holy names. In chanting God's names, there's no loss, no harm, only great gain. By chanting, we gradually cleanse our heart and realize who and what God is. Actually, the purpose of human life is to know God. The special significance, special privilege of being human is that, unlike the animals, we can understand God. In fact, we are meant to understand God. And therefore, in every human society, there's some sort of religion. Every religion, whether Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism, is meant to understand God. The process may be different, the audience may be different, but the goal is the same, to understand God and come closer to him. For example, those in the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish religions, as well as we Vaishnavas, all accept that God created this world. The concepts, God is the supreme, God is great, are accepted by everyone. The only difference is that we give details so that modern people who are advanced in education and scientific knowledge can understand. But the primary principle, to understand God, that God is great, we are tiny, we are subordinate to God, we are maintained by God, this idea is present in all religions. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada was born on September 1st, 1896. He was an Indian spiritual teacher and the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON. Born into an aristocratic Kshatriya family in Calcutta, he was educated at the Scottish Church College there. Before adopting the life of a novice renunciate, or Vanaprasta, in 1950, he was married with children and owned a small pharmaceutical business. In 1959, he took a vow of renunciation, or sannyas, and started writing commentaries on Vaishnava scriptures. In his later years, as a traveling Vaishnava monk, he became an influential communicator of Gaudiya Vaishnava theology in India, and specifically to the West through his leadership of ISKCON, or the Hare Krishna movement. As the founder of ISKCON, he emerged as a major figure of the Western counterculture, initiating thousands of young Americans. Srila Prabhupada was well regarded by religious scholars such as J. Stilson Judah, Harvey Cox, Larry Shin, and Thomas Hopkins, Religious leaders from other Gaudiya Vaishnava institutions have also given him credit for his great achievements. Srila Prabhupada has been described as a charismatic leader who was successful in acquiring followers in many countries, including the United States, Europe, and India. His mission was to propagate throughout the world Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which had been taught to him by his guru, his divine grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. Following his death in 1977, ISKCON, the society he founded based upon Krishnaism, continued to grow. In February of 2014, ISKCON's news agency reported reaching a milestone of distributing over half a billion of his books since 1965. His profound translation and commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, titled The Bhagavad Gita As It Is, is considered by ISKCON adherents and many Vedic scholars globally as the finest, 
bona fide translation of Vaishnava literary works. Born the day after Janamastmi, the birth date of Lord Krishna, one of the most important festivals, into a noble Kshatriya Bengali family in Calcutta, he was named Abhay Charan, or one who is fearless after taking shelter at the Lord's lotus feet. His parents were both devout Vaishnavas. In accordance with Bengali tradition, his mother had gone to the home of her parents for the birth, and only a few days later, Abe returned with his parents to his home at 6 Banerjee Lane in Calcutta. Abe received a European-style education at the Scottish Church College. The young man graduated in 1920 with majors in English, philosophy, and economics. He rejected his diploma in response to Gandhi's independence movement. When he was 22 years old, he married Radharani Devi, who was then 11 years old, in a marriage arranged by their parents. At 14, she gave birth to their first son. Once, Srila Prabhupada had gone to preach about Vaishnavism and Lord Krishna. His wife sold his manuscript to a bookseller in exchange for tea. Quite naturally, Prabhupada was not pleased, inspiring his wife to say in anger that she preferred tea over him. The enthusiastic young man tried his hardest to convince his wife to help him in his mission throughout his household life until 1950, but his wife was not interested. Srila Prabhupada was anxious to fulfill his spiritual master's order of giving the wonderful gift of Krishna consciousness to everyone. So one day, he decided to renounce the household and dedicated his life to humanity. In 1922, he first met his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. It was then he was requested to spread the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the English language. In 1933, he became a formally initiated disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. In 1944, from his front room, he started a publication called Back to Godhead, for which he was designer, publisher, editor, and distributor. He personally designed the logo and a fulgent figure of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the upper left corner with the motto, Godhead is light, nescience is darkness. Prabhupada is a Sanskrit title, literally meaning he who has taken the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Prabhu means Lord, and Pad means taking shelter. This honorific name was used as a respectful form of address by his disciples from late 1967 onwards. Previous to this, his early disciples simply called him Swamiji. From 1950 onwards, he lived at the medieval Radha Damodar Temple in the holy town of Vrindavan, where he began his commentary and translation work of the Sanskrit work Bhagavat Purana. Of all the notable temples in Vrindavan, the Radha Damodar Mandir had at the time the largest collection of copies of the original writings of the six Goswamis and their followers. More than 2,000 separate manuscripts, many of them three to four hundred years old. His guru had always encouraged him to print books. And beholding his spiritual master, Abhay felt the words deeply enter into his own life. If you ever get money, print books. Referring to the need for the literary presentation of the elite Vaishnava culture. The Gaudiamat in Mathura, Uttar Pradesh, was where he lived, wrote, and studied. It is also where he edited his magazine and where he donated a deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which stands on the altar beside those of Radha and Krishna. During his visit in September 1959, he entered the doors of this mat dressed in white as Abe Babu, but he left dressed in saffron as a Vaishnava renunciate or sannyasi. He took his renunciate vows from his friend and godbrother Bhakti Prajana Keshava. On becoming a sannyasi, he also took the title of Swami. He single-handedly published the 17-chapter first book of the Bhagavat Purana, filling three volumes of 400 pages each, enriched with a detailed commentary. 
The introduction to the first volume was a biographical sketch of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He then left India, obtaining a free passage on a freighter named the Jaladuta, with the aim and hope of fulfilling his spiritual master's instruction to preach Krishna consciousness in the Western world. In his possession was a single suitcase, an umbrella, a supply of dry cereal, and about eight dollars worth of Indian currency, as well as several boxes of his self-published book. Prabhupada's Jaladuta Diary, kept between August 25th, 1965, and the 30th of the same month, falls silent for six days. On the seventh day, August 31st, the silence is broken with three simple words passed over a great crisis on the struggle for life and death. When he sailed to the United States in 1965, his trip was not sponsored by any religious organization, nor was he met upon his arrival by a group of loyal followers. As the Indian freighter Jaladuta neared its destination, the magnitude of his intended task weighed heavily upon him. On the 13th of September, he wrote in his diary, Today, I have disclosed my mind to my companion, the Lord Sri Krishna. On this occasion, and on a number of others, Prabhupada called on Krishna for help in his native Bengali. Examining these compositions, academics regard them as intimate records of his prayerful preparation for what lay ahead and a view on how Bhaktivedanta Swami understood his own identity and mission. I do not know why you have brought me here, he wrote. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I might convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. By journeying to the United States, he was attempting to fulfill the wish of his guru, possible only by the grace of his dear Lord Krishna. It was in July of 1966 that he brought global missionary Vaishnavism to the Western world founding the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON, in New York City. He spent much of the last decade of his life setting up the institution. Since he was the society's leader, his personality and his management capabilities were responsible for much of ISKCON's growth and the great reach of his mission. When it was suggested to him at the time of founding ISKCON in 66, a broader term of God consciousness would be preferable to Krishna consciousness in the title. He rejected this recommendation, suggesting that the name of Krishna includes all other forms and concepts of God. After a group of devotees and a temple had been established in New York, another center was started in San Francisco in 1967. From there, he traveled throughout America with his disciples, popularizing the movement through street chanting or sankirtan, book distribution, and public lectures. Once his con was established in San Francisco, a small number of devotees from the temple were sent to London, England, where they came into contact with the Beatles. George Harrison took the greatest interest, spending a significant amount of time speaking with Prabhupada, and even producing a record with members of what became the London Radha Krishna Temple for the Beatles' Apple label. Over the years, his continuing leadership role took him around the world several times, setting up temples and communities on all continents. By the time of his death in Vrindavan in 1977, ISKCON had become an internationally known expression of Vaishnavism. Through his great mission, he followed and communicated the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and introduced Bhakti Yoga to an international audience. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada died on November 14, 1977, at the age of 81 in Vrindavan, India. 
his body was interned in the Iskan Krishna Balaram Temple. In that holy, dusty, transcendental town of Vrindavan. Quotations from His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. If you sell diamonds, you cannot expect to have many customers. But a diamond is a diamond, even if there are no customers. A tree full of ripened fruit bows down naturally because of the weight of the fruits and its willingness to make its fruit accessible to others. Humility means that one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others. The beginning of all knowledge comes from humility. When a Krishna conscious person is elevated to a responsible position, he never becomes puffed up. Similarly, a great soul in Krishna consciousness becomes humbler than the grass and bows down like the fruit trees because such a person acts as the agent of Krishna. Therefore, he discharges his duty with great responsibility. When a pure devotee or a spiritual master speaks, what he says should be accepted as having been directly spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the Parampara system. One should not be happy or distressed over desirables or undesirables, knowing that such feelings are simply created by the mind. Books are the basis. Purity is the force. Preaching is the essence. Utility, the principle. To kill nothing, that is love. The artist draws a picture of a rose very nicely with all attention and artistic sense. And yet it does not become as perfect as the real rose. If that is the real fact, how can we say that the real rose has taken its shape without intelligence behind the beauty? It is better to be an outspoken atheist than a hypocrite. A single grain of devotion is far more valuable than tons of faithfulness. Our first duty is to satisfy the spiritual master who can arrange for the Lord's mercy. A common man must first begin to serve the spiritual master or devotee. Then, through the mercy of the devotee, the Lord will be satisfied. Unless one receives the dust of a devotee's lotus feet on one's head, there is no possibility of advancement. Unless one approaches a pure devotee, he cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is enacted from the spiritual platform, and thus this sound vibration surpasses all lower strata of consciousness, namely sensual, mental, and intellectual. Be very humble, so that Krishna is happy with you. There is a word Christos in the Greek dictionary, and this word is supposed to be borrowed from the Sanskrit word Krishna, and Christ is derived from Christos. Anyone who is steady in his determination for the advanced stage of spiritual realization and can easily tolerate the onslaughts of distress and happiness is certainly a person eligible for liberation. Out of many millions of wandering living entities, one who is very fortunate gets an opportunity to associate with a bona fide spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. By the mercy of both Krishna and the spiritual master, such a person receives the seed of the creeper of devotional service or bhakti. 
Faith is unflinching trust in something divine. Indulgence in animal killing for the taste of the tongue is the grossest kind of ignorance. First, birth is from your parents. But real birth, real life, begins when one accepts a bona fide spiritual master and renders service unto him. Then the path is open for going back to home, back to Godhead to live eternally in full knowledge and full bliss in association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself, Lord Krishna. Actually, it doesn't matter. Christ or Krishna, the name is the same. In Kali Yuga, vice increases to such a point that at the termination of the Yuga, the Supreme Lord Himself appears as the Kalki Avatar. He then vanquishes the demons, saves his devotees, and commences another Satya Yuga. People are eating meat. As long as people eat meat, there will be war. And if a man eats meat, he will be sure to have illicit sex also. Materialistic people are sometimes called sudras, or descendants of monkeys, due to their monkey-like intelligence. They do not care to know how the evolutionary process is taking place. Nor are they eager to know what will happen after they finish their small human lifespan. This is the attitude of sudras. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission, this Krishna consciousness movement, is trying to elevate sudras to the Brahmin platform so that they will know the real goal of life. Unfortunately, Being overly attached to sense gratification, materialists are not serious in helping this movement. Instead, some of them try to suppress it. Thus, it is the business of monkeys to disturb the activities of the Brahmins. Following in the footsteps of Maharaj Pariksit, it is the duty of all executive heads of states to see that the principles of religion, namely austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness are established in the state. Gambling of all description, even a speculative business enterprise, is considered to be degrading, and when gambling is encouraged in the state, there is a complete disappearance of truthfulness. If the state is regulated by the above process, naturally there will be God-consciousness everywhere. We have no hatred for anyone. But when one is demonic or atheistic, we should try to avoid their company. A preacher's business is to love God, to make friendship with the devotees, to enlighten the innocent, and to avoid the demons. The principles are thus that we shall follow. The topmost devotee sees everything in Krishna, and Krishna in everything. Think of Krishna always, and try to work sincerely, and everything will automatically come. For him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. One can attain salvation simply by chanting the holy names of the Lord. Lord Buddha saw the whole human race going to hell by animal killing. So he appeared to teach ahimsa, non-violence, being compassionate on the animals and human beings. In the Christian religion also it is clearly stated, thou shalt not kill. So everywhere animal killing is restricted. In no religion the unnecessary killing of animals is allowed, but nobody is caring for that. The killing process is increasing, and so is the reaction. Every ten years you will find a war. These are the reactions. Religion without philosophy is sentiment, or sometimes fanaticism, while philosophy without religion is mental speculation. Anyone who is steady in his determination for the advanced stage of spiritual realization and can equally tolerate the onslaughts of distress and happiness, is certainly a person eligible for liberation. 
out of the many millions of wandering living entities. One who is very fortunate gets an opportunity to associate with the bona fide spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. By the mercy of both Krishna and the spiritual master, such a person receives the seed of the creeper of devotional service. Love of God is not an ordinary commodity. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was worshipped by Rupa Goswami because he distributed love of God or Krishna Prem to everyone. Rupa Goswami praised him as a great personality because he was freely distributing to everyone love of Godhead, which is achieved by wise men only after many, many births. Krishna Prem, Krishna Consciousness, is the highest gift which can be bestowed upon anyone whom we presume to love. When one's relationship with the Supreme Lord is established, the next program is to act in that relationship. After executing such prescribed duties, when one attains the highest goal of life, love of Godhead, he achieves the fulfillment of his human mission. When I was registering this association in New York, some friend suggested that, why are you giving this name Krishna? Why not put the name God? God Consciousness, then, yes, I can give the name God Consciousness, then it will be confused. Because we want to preach Bhagavad Gita as it is. This is Krishna speaking. And we are trying to place this Krishna's teachings to the world. And not only that, Bhagavan, God, means Krishna. And if I give the name God instead of Krishna, that will bring some sort of competition to Krishna. That is not our purpose. Krishna means God. And if God has any perfect name, that is Krishna. Because Krishna means all attractive. God cannot be attractive for a certain person. God cannot be a Christian God or a Hindu God or a Muslim God. God is equally attractive for Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and Buddhists. If Hindus manufactured a God, and Christians manufactured a God. That may be God, partially, but not the Supreme Lord. The Supreme God is Krishna. You are also God, and I am also God, and every one of us is God. Why? Because God means controller. So controller, every one of us is a controller to a certain extent, but not the complete controller. But Krishna means the complete Controller. Serving or seva means developing love. So unless you de serving or seva means developing love. So unless you develop your love for God, you cannot serve Him anywhere. Whenever you give some service, it is based upon love. Just like a mother is giving service to the helpless child. Why? Love. So similarly, our life will be perfect when our love is perfect with the perfect Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then, everything is all right. Just like Lord Jesus Christ, he never advised economic development or industrial development or this or that, so many things. He sacrificed everything for God. That is one test, that here is a lover of God. And he was punished that you must stop this preaching, but he did not. So that is love of God. He sacrificed everything. So the ideal is Lord Jesus Christ. And the follower must be at least to some extent at that point. That is the test. So we say that you follow any religious path, it doesn't matter. We want to see whether you are a lover of God. This is our propaganda. And if one is serious about loving God, it doesn't matter in which way he'll develop that dormant. And if one is serious about loving God, it doesn't matter in which way he'll develop that dormant love. Those who are bhakti yogis are in love with God, Krishna. They are seeing every moment within their hearts the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anyone you love, you see always within your heart. 
Similarly, if you have love for God or Krishna, then you can see Krishna always. That is the yoga system. The ecstasy of separation from the spiritual master is even greater ecstasy than meeting with him. Love affairs in the material world are only shadows or reflections of a real love with Krishna. If you love Krishna in any capacity, you shall never be frustrated because everything in Krishna is perfect, eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. There are four classes of men. Lazy intelligent, busy intelligent, lazy fool, and busy fool. First class man is lazy intelligent. Busy fool is very dangerous. If Krishna wants to kill somebody, oh, nobody can protect him. And if God wants to protect him, oh, well, then nobody can kill him. In the spiritual world, there is competition for the best satisfaction of Krishna. Whatever Krishna said, that is good. And everything else is bad. Our confusion is now finished. Five plus five is equal to ten. Two plus two is equal to four. So Krishna plus everything is Vrindavan. Do not forget Krishna and you will always be in Vrindavan. A snake can be charmed by herbs and mantra, but the man, envious, cannot be. Therefore, he is more dangerous than a snake. The life of material existence is just like hard wood. And if we can carve Krishna out of it, that is the success of life. Something has dropped in the water, in the river. You cannot see the things dropped within the water by agitating the water. Just stand still for some time. As soon as the water is settled, you'll see things as they are. So as soon as our enthusiasm is agitated, it is better to sit down in any temple suitable and chant Hare Krishna. There is no question of being disappointed. After all, we commit so many mistakes. That is human nature. To err is human. That is not a fault. But try to rectify it with a cool head. As your devotional service becomes mature, you shall see Krishna more and more and more and more. You shall realize the qualities of the holy land of Vraj. These temples... They are just like an oasis in the desert for the conditioned souls to quench the thirst of their desire for real happiness. If you want perfection in your business, then you must try to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, you are simply wasting your time. One man was scheduled to go to a fair, so he dressed himself very nicely. So dressing, dressing, in the meantime, the fair is finished. That is science. All rascals, simply promising with no solution of any problem. You require water immediately. If we become Krishna conscious and chant Hare Krishna, there will be rainfall. And then, even barren land will be fertile. They do not know this. Instead, they are importing water. We must all become ideal in our character, and then people will be very impressed with such purity. A devotee is faultless. He has no flaws. Cleopatra, you have heard the Egyptian history. She was very beautiful, and she conquered many great warriors. Beauty sometimes can conquer even the greatest man, but that does not mean that beauty can conquer God conquer God is bhakti. If you are advanced in devotional service, then you can conquer God, just like the gopis. You said that your job is maya, but you must know that maya is illusion. 
as soon as there is the absence of Krishna consciousness, that is Maya. But you are working just to help and push Krishna's interest. Therefore, it is not Maya. Anything used in Krishna consciousness is real renouncement. The more you cleanse the temple, the more you decorate the deity, the more your heart becomes cleansed, and soon you will become spiritually decorated yourself. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Spiritual anxiety means you are advancing in spiritual life, and material anxiety means you are going downhill. Maya is so strong that as soon as I am sitting in a solitary place, then I'll think of money and women. Therefore, we should live always in the assembly of devotees and chant Hare Krishna and save ourselves from the danger of material fall-downs. When we are children, when we are children, innocent, we have no bad habits. But as we grow and associate with bad company, we also acquire all of those bad habits. To give up all these bad habits means that we have to associate with sadhus or devotees, saintly persons. Then we can give it up. These are called anarthas, or giving up all bad habits. A devotee always accepts his distress as minimized by God's mercy. Anyone who accepts this philosophy of God's mercy and suffering and still makes progress in Krishna consciousness, it is said that he is sure to go back to home, back to Godhead. The spiritual master and Krishna are two parallel lines. The train on two tracks moves forward. The spiritual master and Krishna are like these two tracks. They must be served simultaneously. Krishna helps one to find the bona fide spiritual master, and the bona fide spiritual master helps one to understand Krishna. If one does not get a bona fide spiritual master, then how can he ever understand Krishna? You cannot serve Krishna without the spiritual master, or serve the spiritual master without serving Krishna. In God's creation, there is male and female, even in the spiritual world, and there is purpose for such a creation. The purpose is so that the male and female may join together, not for sex life, but to glorify the Lord. In Vaikuntha, the women are much more beautiful in their figure, smiling, dressing, etc. But the men and women there are so much attracted by the chanting of Hare Krishna that they do not get any sex impulse, even by intimate mingling. Suicide is never justified. It is a violation of nature's law. Nature gives you a certain type of body to live in for a certain number of days, and suicide means you go against the law of nature. You untimely stop the duration of life. Therefore, he becomes a criminal. Suicide is criminal, even in ordinary state law. One cannot commit suicide. Women are by nature endowed with many artistic tendencies. And from the Vedic age, we will find high-grade women and girls were highly qualified in 64 arts. Srimadhi Ratarani was fully qualified in those arts, and therefore, by her super-excellent transcendental qualities, she could charm Krishna. One of the foremost proponents of devotional yoga, or bhakti, in the latter part of the 20th century was His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada from the ancient Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Here he advises us just how long it takes to realize the sublime, absolute, original truth, or God. Someone who is not afraid to die and says that he's not suffering. He he's a madman. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Who oh, is caring for madman's work? That will take time. 
How can we expect? Then one minute everyone will understand everything. He requires education, time. If he is prepared to give the time, then he will understand. <clears throat> not that within five minutes, ten minutes he will understand the whole thing. That's not possible. He is a diseased man. He requires treatment, medicine, and diet. In this way he will understand. A diseased man, if he doesn't care for medicine, diet, then he will suffer. We have been here for many lifetimes performing sinful activities. So is it possible to counteract all those sinful activities in one lifetime, or does it require many One lives? minute. That is Krishna consciousness movement. One minute. You are not reading Bhagavad Gita? What Krishna says? Sarva Sarman Paritajya Mami Kang Saranang Braja Ongta Sarva Pape Bha Mokshayami. You surrender unto me, give up your all business. I will give you relief from all sinful reaction. Immediately. Read the one minute. My dear Krishna, I was forgotten. Now I understand. I fully surrender to you. And you become immediately free from all things. Without any reservation. Without any politics. If you fully surrender, Krishna is assuring. Antva sarva papi. Homokhaisami. Masucha. He reassures. Don't worry whether I will be able to to give you relief from all reactions. It is guaranteed. You do this. So how much time it requires to surrender to Krishna? Immediately you can do that. Surrender means you surrender and what? As Krishna says, that is surrender. What Krishna says to do? Manmana bhavamad bhakta madhyaji maagnamaskaru. Four things. You always think of me, and you become my devotee, you worship me, and offer your respect, full obeisances, and you do these four things. That is full surrender. Mami vaśyasi, asaṅsa. Then you come to me without any doubt. Everything is there. Uh, Krishna has given everything fully. If you accept it, then life is very simple. There is no difficulty. The Bhagavad Gita, or the Song of God, is a 700-verse Vedic scripture which is part of the epic Mahabharata. It is indeed the most holy of all scriptures. The Gita is set in a narrative framework of a dialogue between Pandava Prince Arjuna and his guide and charioteer Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As a righteous war commences between the Pandavas and the Kuvaras, Arjuna is filled with despair about the violence and death the war will cause in this battle against his own family. He wonders if he should renounce everything, and thus he seeks Krishna's counsel, whose answers and discourse constitute the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavan Sri Krishna counsels Arjuna to fulfill his kshatriya or warrior duty to uphold the Dharma through selfless action. The Krishna Arjuna dialogues cover a broad range of spiritual topics, touching upon ethical dilemmas and philosophical issues that go far, far beyond the war which Arjuna faces. The holy, eternal, transcendental Bhagavad Gita presents a synthesis of Vedic ideas about Dharma, Bhakti, and the yogic path. The Gita is therefore the best known and most famous of all Vedic texts. Faithfully read and studied by millions of devotees around the world, 
the illumined purport of the Gita has influenced many great personalities, such as Mahatma Gandhi, Aldous Huxley, Henry David Thoreau, J. Robert Oppenheimer, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Carl Jung, Albert Einstein, and George Harrison, among many others. This, then, is the Bhagavad Gita, as it is. One may ask, what led to the great war on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, where the Bhagavad Gita was spoken? More than 5,000 years ago, the great king Vichitravirya passed away. Because his eldest son, Dhritarashtra, was born blind and thus not fit to rule, Pandu, the younger son, inherited the kingdom. After the death of King Pandu, his five sons, known as the Pandavas, became the lawful inheritors of the kingdom. But as the Pandavas were just still boys, Dhritarashtra assumed the throne for himself. Dhritarashtra had one hundred sons, known as the Kuravas. When the Pandavas came of age and were ready to rule the kingdom, they did not want the entire kingdom for themselves, which was rightfully theirs. They were willing to share the kingdom with their cousins. Thus the kingdom was divided into two halves between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Duryodhan, the eldest of the Kauravas, was not satisfied with his share. He wanted to enjoy the entire kingdom for himself. He made several attempts to kill the Pandavas, but was unsuccessful. He then unlawfully took possession of the entire kingdom and forced the Pandavas into exile. The Pandavas then requested just five villages, one for each brother. To this Duryodhan replied, he would not give them enough land to stick a pin into. Lord Krishna pleaded for a peaceful and non-violent resolution to the land dispute, but Duryodhan rejected him and declared war on the Pandavas. The big war of Mahabharata was thus inevitable. In preparation for the war, both Duryodhan and Arjun approached Lord Krishna for help. Krishna, as God himself, would not turn away anyone who approaches him for help, be they good or wicked. Lord Krishna offered his entire army to one side and himself as an advisor to the other side. Duryodhan snapped at Lord Krishna's army and Arjun was eager for the Lord himself as an advisor. Thus Lord Krishna became the advisor and charioteer to Arjun. Arjuna faced a dilemma on the battlefield, whether to fight for his rights or run away from the war and let the wicked and evil sons of Dhritarashtra rule the kingdom. Chapter 1. Observing the Armies on the Battlefield of Kurukshetra Dhritarashtra said, O Sanjaya, after assembling in the place of pilgrimage at Kurukshetra, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do, being desirous to fight? Sanjaya said, O king, after looking over the army gathered by the sons of Pandu, King Duryodhana went to his teacher and began to speak the following words. O my teacher, Behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. Here in this army there are many heroic bowmen equal in fighting to Bhima and Arjun. There are also great fighters like Yuyudhana, Virata, and Drupada. There are also great heroic powerful fighters like Dristaketu, Chekitana, Kasiraj, Purujit, Kuntiboj, and Shaibya. There are the mighty Yudhamanyu, the very powerful Uttamaja, the son of Subhadra, and the sons of Draupadi. All these warriors are great chariot fighters. O best of the Brahmanas, for your information, let me tell you about the captains who are especially qualified to lead my military force. There are personalities like yourself, Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, Ashvatama, Vikarna, and the son of Somodatta called Borishrava, who are always victorious in battle. There are many other heroes who are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. All of them are well equipped with different kinds of weapons, and all are experienced in military science. 
Our strength is immeasurable, and we are perfectly protected by Grandfather Bhishma, whereas the strength of the Pandavas, carefully protected by Bhima, is limited. Now all of you must give full support to Grandfather Bhishma, standing at your respective strategic points in the phalanx of the army. Then Bhishma, the great valiant grandsire of the Kuru dynasty, the grandfather of the fighters, blew his conch shell very loudly like the sound of a lion, giving Duryodhana joy. After that, the conch shells, bugles, trumpets, drums, and horns were all suddenly sounded, and the combined sound was tumultuous. On the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental conch shells. Then Lord Krishna blew his conch shell called Panchajanya, Arjuna blew his, the Devadatta, and Bhima, the voracious eater and performer of Herculean tasks, blew his terrific conch shell called Pundram. King Yudhisthira, the son of Kunti, blew his conch shell, the Ananta Vijaya, and Nakula and Sahadev blew the Sugosha and Mani Pushpaka. That great archer, the king of Kashi, the great fighter Shikandi, Dristajumna, Virata, and the unconquerable Satyaki, Drupada, the sons of Draupadi, and the others, O king, such as the son of Subhadra, greatly armed, all blew their respective conch shells. The blowing of these different conch shells became uproarious, and thus vibrating both in the sky and on the earth, it shattered the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra. O king, at that time Arjuna, the son of Pandu, who was seated in his chariot, his flag marked with Hanuman, took up his bow and prepared to shoot his arrows, looking at the sons of Dhritarashtra. O king, Arjuna then spoke to Rishikesh these words. Arjuna said, O infallible one, please draw my chariot between the two armies, so that I may see who is present here, who is desirous of fighting and with whom I must contend in this great battle attempt. Let me see those who have come here to fight, wishing to please the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra. Sanjaya said, O descendant of Bharata, being thus addressed by Arjuna, Lord Krishna drew up the fine chariot in the midst of the armies of both parties. In the presence of Bhishma, Drona, and all the other chieftains of the world, Rishikesh, the Lord said, Just behold, Partha, all the Kurus who are assembled here. There Arjuna could see within the midst of the armies of both parties, his fathers, grandfathers, teachers, maternal uncles, brothers, sons, grandsons, friends, and also his father-in-law and well-wishers all present there. When the son of Kunti Arjuna saw all these different grades of friends and relatives, he became overwhelmed with compassion and spoke thus. Arjuna said, My dear Krishna, seeing my friends and relatives present before me in such a fighting spirit, I feel the limbs of my body quivering and my mouth drying up. My whole body is trembling and my hair is standing on end. My bow Gandiva is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. I am now unable to stand here any longer. I am forgetting myself and my mind is reeling. I foresee only evil, O killer of the Keshi demon. I do not see how any good can come from killing my own kinsmen in this battle, nor can I, my dear Krishna, desire any subsequent victory, kingdom, or happiness. O Govinda, of what avail to us are kingdoms, happiness, or even life itself when all those for whom we may desire them are now arrayed in this battlefield? O Madhusudana, when teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, brothers-in-law, and all relatives are ready to give up their lives and properties and are standing before me, then why should I wish to kill them, though I may survive? O maintainer of all creatures, I am not prepared to fight with them even in exchange for the three worlds, let alone this earth. Sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. Therefore, it is not proper for us to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra and our friends. What should we gain, O Krishna, husband of the goddess of fortune? And how could we be happy by killing our own kinsmen? O Janardana, although these men, overtaken by greed, see no fault in killing one's family or quarreling with friends, why should we, with knowledge of the sin, engage in these acts? With the destruction of dynasty, the eternal family tradition is vanquished, 
and thus the rest of the family becomes involved in irreligious practice. When irreligion is prominent in the family, O Krishna, the women of the family become corrupt, and from the degradation of womanhood, O descendant of Vrishni, comes unwanted progeny. When there is increase of unwanted population, a hellish situation is created both for the family and for those who destroy the family tradition. In such corrupt families, there is no offering of oblations of food and water to the ancestors. Due to the evil deeds of the destroyers of family tradition, all kinds of community projects and family welfare activities are devastated. O Krishna, maintainer of the people, I have heard by disciplic succession that those who destroy family traditions dwell always in hell. Alas, how strange it is that we are preparing to commit greatly sinful acts driven by the desire to enjoy royal happiness. I would consider it better for the sons of Dhritarashtra to kill me unarmed and unresisting rather than fight with them. Sanjaya said, Arjuna having thus spoken on the battlefield, cast aside his bow and arrows and sat down on the chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. Chapter 2 Contents of the Gita Summarized Sanjaya said, Seeing Arjuna full of compassion and very sorrowful, his eyes brimming with tears, Madhusudana Krishna spoke the following words. The Supreme Person, Bhagavan, said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the progressive values of life. They do not lead to higher planets, but to infamy. O son of Pritha, do not yield to this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up such petty weakness of heart and arise, O chastiser of the enemy. Arjuna said, O killer of Madhu, Krishna, how can I counterattack with arrows in battle men like Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of my worship? It is better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though they are avaricious, they are nonetheless superiors. If they are killed, our spoils will be tainted with blood. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. The sons of Dhritarashtra, whom if we killed we should not care to live, are now standing before us on this battlefield. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of weakness. In this condition, I am asking you to tell me clearly what is best for me. Now I am your disciple, and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. I can find no means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to destroy it, even if I win an unrivaled kingdom on the earth, with sovereignty like the demigods in heaven. Sanjaya said, Having spoken thus, Arjuna, chastiser of the enemies, told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. O descendant of Bharata, at that time Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. The blessed Lord said, While speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body, from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O scion of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress 
and is steady in both, is certainly eligible for liberation. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent there is no endurance, and of the existent there is no cessation. This seers have concluded by studying the nature of both. Know that which pervades the entire body is indestructible. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. Only the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is subject to destruction. Therefore fight, O descendant of Bharata. He who thinks that the living entity is the slayer, or that he is slain, does not understand. One who is in knowledge knows that the self slays not, nor is slain. For the soul there is never birth nor death, nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, undying and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. O Partha, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, unborn, eternal and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, Similarly, the soul accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. The soul can never be cut into pieces by any weapon, nor can he be burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble, and can neither be burned nor dried. He is everlasting, all-pervading, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable, immutable, and unchangeable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. If, however, you think that the soul is perpetually born and always dies, still you have no reason to lament, O mighty armed. For one who has taken his birth, death is certain, and for one who is dead, birth is certain. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanifest again when they are annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? Some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear of him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. O descendant of Bharata, he who dwells in the body is eternal and can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any creature. Considering your specific duty as a Chatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles, and so there is no need for hesitation. O Partha, happy are the Chatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. If, however, you do not fight this religious war, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. People will always speak of your infamy, and for one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider you a coward. Your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? O oh, son of Kunti, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up and fight with determination. Do thou fight for the sake of fighting, without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat. And by so doing, you shall never incur sin. Thus far I have declared to you the analytical knowledge of Sankhya philosophy. Now listen to the knowledge of yoga, whereby one works without fruitive result. O son of Partha, when you act by such intelligence, you can free yourself from the bondage of works. In this endeavor there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Those who are on this path are resolute in purpose, and their aim is one. O beloved child of the Kurus, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many-branched. 
Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas, which recommend various fruitive activities for elevation to heavenly planets, resultant good birth, power, and so forth. Being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, they say that there is nothing more than this. In the minds of those who are too attached to sense enjoyment and material opulence, and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination of devotional service to the Supreme Lord does not take place. The Vedas mainly deal with the subject of the three modes of material nature. Rise above these modes, O Arjuna. Be transcendental to all of them. Be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety, and be established in the self. All purposes that are served by the small pond can at once be served by the great reservoirs of water. Similarly, all purposes of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you are not entitled to the fruits of action. Never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities, and never be attached to not doing your duty. Be steadfast in yoga, O Arjuna. Perform your duty and abandon all attachment to success or failure. Such evenness of mind is called yoga. O Dhananjaya, rid yourself of all fruit of activities by devotional service and surrender fully to that consciousness. Those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. A man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad actions, even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, O Arjuna, which is the art of all work. The wise engaged in devotional service take refuge in the Lord and free themselves from the cycle of birth and death by renouncing the fruits of action in the material world. In this way, they can attain that state beyond all miseries. When your intelligence has passed out of the dense forest of delusion, you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is to be heard. When your mind is no longer disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas, and when it remains fixed in the trance of self-realization, then you will have attained the divine consciousness. Arjuna said, What are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? How does he speak and what is his language? How does he sit, and how does he walk? The blessed Lord said, O Partha, when a man gives up all varieties of sense desire which arise from mental concoction, and when his mind finds satisfaction in the self alone, then he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. One who is not disturbed in spite of the threefold miseries, who is not elated when there is happiness, and who is free from attachment Fear and anger is called a sage of steady mind. He who is without attachment, who does not rejoice when he obtains good, nor lament when he obtains evil, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. One who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects, as the tortoise draws his limbs within the shell, is to be understood as truly situated in knowledge. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though the taste for sense objects remains, but ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination who is endeavoring to control them. One who restrains his senses and fixes his consciousness upon me, is known as a man of steady intelligence. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment lust develops, and from lust anger arises. From anger delusion arises, and from delusion bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost, and when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. One who can control his senses by practicing the regulated principles of freedom can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord 
and thus become free from all attachment and aversion. For one who is so situated in the divine consciousness, the threefold miseries of material existence exist no longer. In such a happy state, one's intelligence soon becomes steady. One who is not in transcendental consciousness can have neither a controlled mind nor steady intelligence, without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? As a boat on the water is swept away by a strong wind, even one of the senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. Therefore, O mighty armed, one whose senses are restrained from their objects is certainly of steady intelligence. What is night for all beings is the time of awakening for the self-controlled, and the time of awakening for all beings is night for the introspective sage. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into an ocean, which is ever being filled but is always still, can alone achieve peace, and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. A person who has given up all desires for sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship, and is devoid of false ego, he alone can attain real peace. That is the way of the spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered. Being so situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God. Chapter 3 Karma Yoga Arjuna said, O Janardana, O Keshava, why do you urge me to engage in this ghastly warfare? if you think that intelligence is better than fruitive work. My intelligence is bewildered by your equivocal instructions. Therefore, please tell me decisively what is most beneficial for me. The Blessed Lord said, O sinless Arjuna, I have already explained that there are two classes of men who realize the self. Some are inclined to understand him by empirical philosophical speculation and others are inclined to know him by devotional work. Not by merely abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from reaction, nor by renunciation alone can one attain perfection. All men are forced to act helplessly according to the impulses born of the modes of material nature. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. One who restrains the senses and organs of action but whose mind dwells on sense objects, certainly deludes himself and is called a pretender. On the other hand, he who controls the senses by the mind and engages his active organs in works of devotion without attachment is by far superior. Perform your prescribed duty, for action is better than inaction. A man cannot even maintain his physical body without work. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work binds one to this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. And in that way, you will always remain unattached and free from bondage. In the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of men and demigods, along with sacrifices for Vishnu, and blessed them by saying, be thou happy by this yagna, sacrifice, because its performance will bestow upon you all desirable things. The demigods, being pleased by sacrifices, will also please you. Thus nourishing one another, there will reign general prosperity for all. In charge of the various necessities of life, the demigods, being satisfied by the performance of yagna, sacrifice, supply all necessities to man. But he who enjoys these gifts without offering them to the demigods in return is certainly a thief. The devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sins because they eat food which is offered first for sacrifice. Others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. All living bodies subsist on food grains, 
which are produced from rain. Rains are produced by performance of yagna, sacrifice, and yagna is born of prescribed duties. Regulated activities are prescribed in the Vedas, and the Vedas are directly manifested from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Consequently, the all-pervading transcendence is eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. My dear Arjuna, a man who does not follow this prescribed Vedic system of sacrifice certainly leads a life of sin. For a person delighting only in the senses lives in vain. One who is, however, taking pleasure in the self, who is illumined in the self, who rejoices in and is satisfied with the self only, fully satiated, for him there is no duty. A self-realized man has no purpose to fulfill in the discharge of his prescribed duties, nor has he any reason not to perform such work, nor has he any need to depend on any other living being. Therefore, without being attached to the fruits of activities, one should act as a matter of duty, for by working without attachment, one attains the supreme. Even kings like Janaka and others attained the perfectional stage by performance of prescribed duties. Therefore, just for the sake of educating the people in general, you should perform your work. Whatever action is performed by a great man, common men will follow in his footsteps, and whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. O son of Pritha, there is no work prescribed for me within all the three planetary systems, nor am I in want of anything, nor have I need to obtain anything, and yet I am engaged in work. For if I did not engage in work, O Partha, certainly all men would follow my path. If I should cease to work, then all these worlds would be put to ruination. I would also be the cause of creating unwanted population, and I would thereby destroy the peace of all sentient beings. As the ignorant perform their duties with attachment to results, similarly the learned may also act, but without attachment, for the sake of leading people on the right path. Let not the wise disrupt the minds of the ignorant who are attached to fruit of action. They should not be encouraged to refrain from work, but to engage in work in the spirit of devotion. The bewildered spirit soul, under the influence of the three modes of material nature, thinks himself to be the doer of activities, which are in actuality carried out by nature. One who is in knowledge of the absolute truth, O mighty armed, does not engage himself in the senses and sense gratification, knowing well the differences between work and devotion and work for fruitive results. Bewildered by the modes of material nature, the ignorant fully engage themselves in material activities and become attached. But the wise should not unsettle them, although these duties are inferior due to the performer's lack of knowledge. Therefore, O Arjuna, surrendering all your works unto me, with mind intent on me, and without desire for gain, and free from egoism and lethargy, fight. One who executes his duties according to my injunctions and who follows this teaching faithfully, without envy, becomes free from the bondage of fruitive actions. But those who out of envy disregard these teachings and do not practice them regularly are to be considered bereft of all knowledge, befooled, and doomed to ignorance and bondage. Even a man of knowledge acts according to his own nature for everyone follows his nature. What can repression accomplish? Attraction and repulsion for sense objects are felt by the embodied beings, but one should not fall under the control of senses and sense objects because they are stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. It is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties even though they may be faulty than another's duties. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties, for to follow another's path is dangerous. Arjuna said, O descendant of Vrishni, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? The blessed Lord said, 
It is lust only, Arjuna, which is born of contact with the material modes of passion and later transformed into wrath, and which is the all-devouring, sinful enemy of this world. As fire is covered by smoke, as a mirror is covered by dust, or as the embryo is covered by the womb, similarly the living entity is covered by different degrees of this lust. Thus, a man's pure consciousness is covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. The senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the sitting places of this lust, which veils the real knowledge of the living entity and bewilders him. Therefore, O Arjuna, best of the Bharatas, in the very beginning curb this great symbol of sin, lust, by regulating the senses and slay this destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. The working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses, intelligence is still higher than the mind, and he, the soul, is even higher than the intelligence. Thus knowing oneself to be transcendental to material senses, mind, and intelligence, one should control the lower self by the higher self and thus, by spiritual strength, conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. Chapter 4 Transcendental Knowledge The Blessed Lord said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god, Vivishwan, and Vivishwan, instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshvaku. This supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in due course of time the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend. Therefore, you can understand the transcendental mystery of this science. Arjuna said, The sun god Vivishwan is senior by birth to you. How am I to understand that in the beginning you instructed this science to him? The blessed Lord said, Many, many births both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them but you cannot, O subduer of the enemy. Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, and although I am the Lord of all sentient beings, I still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. In order to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants, as well as to re-establish the principles of religion, I advent myself millennium after millennium. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjun. Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me, Many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love for me. All of them, as they surrender unto me, I reward accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Pritha. Men in this world desire success and fruit of activities, and therefore they worship the demigods. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruit of work in this world. According to the three modes of material nature and the work ascribed to them, the four divisions of human society were created by me. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer, being unchangeable. There is no work that affects me, nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not become entangled in the fruit of reactions of work. All the liberated souls in ancient times acted with this understanding, and so attained liberation. Therefore, as the ancients, you should perform your duty in this divine consciousness. 
Even the intelligent are bewildered in determining what is action and what is inaction. Now I shall explain to you what action is, knowing which you shall be liberated from all sins. The intricacies of action are very hard to understand. Therefore, one should know properly what action is, what forbidden action is, and what inaction is. One who sees inaction, inaction, and action in inaction is intelligent among men, and he is in the transcendental position, although engaged in all sorts of activities. One is understood to be in full knowledge whose every act is devoid of desire for sense gratification. He is said by sages to be a worker whose fruit of action is burned up by the fire of perfect knowledge. Abandoning all attachment to the results of his activities, Ever satisfied and independent, he performs no fruit of action, although engaged in all kinds of undertakings. Such a man of understanding acts with mind and intelligence perfectly controlled, gives up all sense of proprietorship over his possessions, and acts only for the bare necessities of life. Thus working, he is not affected by sinful reactions. He who is satisfied with gain which comes of its own accord who is free from duality and does not envy, who is steady both in success and failure, is never entangled, although performing actions. The work of a man who is unattached to the modes of material nature and who is fully situated in transcendental knowledge merges entirely into transcendence. A person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. Some yogis perfectly worship the demigods by offering different sacrifices to them, and some of them offer sacrifices in the fire of the Supreme Brahman. Some of them sacrifice the hearing process and the senses in the fire of the controlled mind, and others sacrifice the objects of the senses, such as sound, in the fire of sacrifice. Those who are interested in self-realization in terms of mind and sense control offer the functions of all the senses as well as the vital force, breath, as oblations into the fire of the controlled mind. There are others who, enlightened by sacrificing their material possessions in severe austerities, take strict vows and practice the yoga of eightfold mysticism, and others study the Vedas for the advancement of transcendental knowledge. And there are even others who are inclined to the process of breath restraint to remain in trance, and they practice stopping the movement of the outgoing breath into the incoming, and the incoming breath into the outgoing, and thus at last remain in trance, stopping all breathing. Some of them, curtailing the eating process, offer the outgoing breath into itself as a sacrifice. All these performers who know the meaning of sacrifice become cleansed of sinful reaction, and having tasted the nectar of the remnants of such sacrifice, they go to the supreme eternal atmosphere. O best of the Kuru dynasty, without sacrifice one can never live happily on this planet or in this life. What then of the next? All these different types of sacrifice are approved by the Vedas, and all of them are born of different types of work. Knowing them as such, you will become liberated. O chastiser of the enemy, the sacrifice of knowledge is greater than the sacrifice of material possessions. O son of Pritha, after all, the sacrifice of work culminates in transcendental knowledge. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master, inquire from him submissively, and render service unto him. The self-realized soul can impart knowledge unto you because he has seen the truth. And when you have thus learned the truth, you will know that all living beings are but part of me, and that they are in me and are mine. Even if you are considered to be the most sinful of all sinners, when you are situated in the boat of transcendental knowledge, you will be able to cross over the ocean of miseries. As the blazing fire turns firewood to ashes, O Arjun, so does the fire of knowledge burn to ashes all reactions to material activities. 
In this world, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism, and one who has achieved this enjoys the self within himself in due course of time. A faithful man who is absorbed in transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Therefore, one who has renounced the fruits of his action, whose doubts are destroyed by transcendental knowledge, and who is situated firmly in the self, is not bound by works, O conqueror of riches. Therefore, the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O Bharata, stand and fight. Chapter 5 Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness Arjuna said, O Krishna, first of all you ask me to renounce work, and then again you recommend work with devotion. Now will you kindly tell me, definitely, which of the two is more beneficial? The Blessed Lord said, The renunciation of work and work in devotion are both good for liberation, but of the two, work in devotional service is better than renunciation of works. One who neither hates nor desires the fruits of his activities is known to be always renounced. Such a person, liberated from all dualities, easily overcomes material bondage and is completely liberated, O mighty armed Arjun. Only the ignorant speak of karma yoga and devotional service as being different from the analytical study of the material world, Shankya. Those who are actually learned say that he who applies himself well to one of these paths achieves the results of both. One who knows that the position reached by means of renunciation can also be attained by works in devotional service and who therefore sees that the path of works and the path of renunciation are one, sees things as they are. Unless one is engaged in the devotional service of the Lord, mere renunciation of activities cannot make one happy. The sages, purified by works of devotion, achieve the supreme without delay. One who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, and who controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Although always working, such a man is never entangled. A person in the divine consciousness, although engaged in seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving about, sleeping, and breathing, always knows within himself that he actually does nothing at all. Because while speaking, evacuating, receiving, opening, or closing his eyes, he always knows that only the material senses are engaged with their objects and that he is aloof from them. One who performs his duty without attachment, surrendering the results unto the Supreme God, is not affected by sinful action, as the lotus leaf is untouched by water. The yogis, abandoning attachment, act with body, mind, intelligence, and even with the senses, only for the purpose of purification. The steadily devoted soul attains unadulterated peace, because he offers the result of all activities to me, whereas a person who is not in union with the divine, who is greedy for the fruits of his labor, becomes entangled. When the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally renounces all actions, he resides happily in the city of nine gates, the material body, neither working nor causing work to be done. The embodied spirit, master of the city of his body, does not create activities nor does he induce people to act, nor does he create the fruits of action. All this is enacted by the modes of material nature. Nor does the Supreme Spirit assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. When, however, 
one is enlightened with the knowledge by which nescience is destroyed. Then his knowledge reveals everything as the sun lights up everything in the daytime. When one's intelligence, mind, faith, and refuge are all fixed in the Supreme, then one becomes fully cleansed of misgivings through complete knowledge and thus proceeds straight on the path of liberation. The humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision a learned and gentle brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog-eater, outcast. Those whose minds are established in sameness and equanimity have already conquered the conditions of birth and death. They are flawless like Brahman, and thus they are already situated in Brahman. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant, nor laments upon obtaining something unpleasant, who is self-intelligent, unbewildered, and who knows the science of God, is to be understood as already situated in transcendence. Such a liberated person is not attracted to material sense pleasure or external objects, but is always in trance, enjoying the pleasure within. In this way, the self-realized person enjoys unlimited happiness, for he concentrates on the Supreme. An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise man does not delight in them. Before giving up this present body, if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses and check the force of desire and anger, he is a yogi and is happy in this world. One whose happiness is within, who is active within, who rejoices within and is illumined within, is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme and ultimately he attains the Supreme. One who is beyond duality and doubt, whose mind is engaged within, who is always busy working for the welfare of all sentient beings, and who is free from all sins, achieves liberation in the Supreme. Those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self-realized, self-disciplined, and constantly endeavoring for perfection, are assured of liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. Shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the nostrils, thus controlling the mind, senses, and intelligence, the transcendentalist becomes free from desire, fear, and anger. One who is always in this state is certainly liberated. The sages knowing me as the ultimate purpose of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attain peace from the pangs of material miseries. Chapter 6 Sankhya Yoga The Blessed Lord said, One who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life. And he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire and performs no work. What is called renunciation is the same as yoga, or linking oneself with the Supreme. For no one can become a yogi unless he renounces the desire for sense gratification. For one who is a neophyte in the Eightfold Yoga system, work is said to be the means. And for one who has already attained to yoga, Cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. A person is said to have attained to yoga when having renounced all material desires, he neither acts for sense gratification nor engages in fruitive activities. A man must elevate himself by his own mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. For him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends, but for one who has failed to do so, his very mind will be the greatest enemy. For one who has conquered the mind, the Supersoul is already reached, for he has attained tranquility. 
To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. A person is said to be established in self-realization and is called a yogi or mystic when he is fully satisfied by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization. Such a person is situated in transcendence and is self-controlled. He sees everything, whether it be pebbles, stones, or gold, as the same. A person is said to be still further advanced when he regards all, the honest well-wisher, friends and enemies, the envious, the pious, the sinner, and those who are indifferent and impartial with an equal mind. A transcendentalist should always try to concentrate his mind on the Supreme Self. He should live alone in a secluded place and should always carefully control his mind. He should be free from desire and feelings of possessiveness. To practice yoga, one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deerskin and a soft cloth. The seat should neither be too high nor too low and should be situated in a sacred place. The yogi should then sit on it very firmly and should practice yoga by controlling the mind and the senses, purifying the heart and fixing the mind on one point. One should hold one's body, neck and head erect in a straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose. Thus, with an unagitated, subdued mind, devoid of fear, completely free from sex life, one should meditate upon me within the heart and make me the ultimate goal of life. Thus practicing control of the body, mind and activities, the mystic transcendentalist attains to the kingdom of God or the abode of Krishna by cessation of material existence. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi, O Arjuna, if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. He who is temperate in his habits of eating, sleeping, working and recreation can mitigate all the material pains by practicing the yoga system. When the yogi by practice of yoga disciplines his mental activities and becomes situated in transcendence, devoid of all material desires, he is said to have attained yoga. As a lamp in a windless place does not waver, so the transcendentalist, whose mind is controlled, remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendent self. The stage of perfection is called trance or samadhi, when one's mind is completely restrained from material mental activities by practice of yoga. This is characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind and to relish and rejoice in the self. In that joyous state, one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness and enjoys himself through transcendental senses. Established thus, one never departs from the truth, and upon gaining this, he thinks there is no greater gain. Being situated in such a position, one is never shaken even in the midst of greatest difficulty. This indeed is actual freedom from all miseries arising from material contact. One should engage oneself in the practice of yoga with undeviating determination and faith. One should abandon without exception all material desires born of false ego and thus control all the senses on all sides by the mind. Gradually, step by step, with full conviction, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence and thus the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of nothing else. From whatever and wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. The yogi whose mind is fixed on me verily attains the highest happiness. By virtue of his identity with Brahman, he is liberated. His mind is peaceful, his passions are quieted, and he is freed from sin. Steady in the self, being freed from all material contamination, the yogi achieves the highest perfectional stage of happiness in touch with the Supreme Consciousness. A true yogi observes me in all beings and also sees every being in me. 
Indeed, the self-realized man sees me everywhere. For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. The yogi who knows that I and the Supersoul within all creatures are one worships me and remains always in me in all circumstances. He is a perfect yogi who, by comparison to his own self, sees the true equality of all beings, both in their happiness and distress, O Arjuna. Arjuna said, O Madhusudana, the system of yoga which you have summarized appears impractical and unendurable to me, for the mind is restless and unsteady. For the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong, O Krishna, and to subdue it, it seems to me, more difficult than controlling the wind. The blessed Lord said, O mighty armed son of Kunti, it is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind, but it is possible by constant practice and by detachment. For one whose mind is unbridled, self-realization is difficult work, but he whose mind is controlled and who strives by right means is assured of success. That is my opinion. Arjuna said, What is the destination of the man of faith who does not persevere, who in the beginning takes to the process of self-realization, but who later desists due to worldly-mindedness and thus does not attain perfection in mysticism? O mighty armed Krishna, does not such a man being deviated from the path of transcendence perish like a riven cloud with no position in any sphere? This is my doubt, O Krishna, and I ask you to dispel it completely. But for yourself, no one is to be found who can destroy this doubt. The blessed Lord said, Son of Pritta, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction, either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. The unsuccessful yogi, after many, many years of enjoyment on the planets of the pious living entities, is born into a family of righteous people or into a family of rich aristocracy. Or he takes his birth in a family of transcendentalists who are surely great in wisdom. Verily, such a birth is rare in this world. On taking such a birth, he again revives the divine consciousness of his previous life, and he tries to make further progress in order to achieve complete success, O son of Kuru. By virtue of the divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes attracted to the yogic principles, even without seeking them. Such an inquisitive transcendentalist, striving for yoga, stands always above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures. But when the yogi engages himself with sincere endeavor in making further progress, being washed of all contaminations, then ultimately, after many, many births of practice, he attains the supreme goal. A yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruitive worker. Therefore, O Arjun, in all circumstances, be a yogi. And of all yogis, he who always abides in me with great faith, worshipping me in transcendental loving service, is most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. Chapter 7 Knowledge of the Absolute Now hear, O son of Pritha, Arjuna, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. I shall now declare unto you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and noumenal, by knowing which there shall remain nothing further to be known. Out of many thousands among men, one may endeavor for perfection, and of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego, altogether these eight comprise my separate material energies. Besides this inferior energy, O mighty armed Arjun, there is a superior energy of mine, 
which are all living entities who are struggling with material nature and are sustaining the universe. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world, know for certain that I am both its origin and dissolution. O conqueror of wealth, Arjun, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. O son of Kunti, Arjun, I am the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound in ether and the ability in man. I am the original fragrance of the earth, and I am the heat and fire. I am the life of all that lives, and I am the penance of all ascetics. O son of Pritha, know that I am the original seed of all existences, the intelligence of the intelligent, and the prowess of all powerful men. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. I am sex life, which is not contrary to religious principles, O Lord of the Bardas, Arjuna. All states of being, be they of goodness, passion, or ignorance, are manifested by my energy. I am, in one sense, everything, but I am independent. I am not under the modes of this material nature. Deluded by the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, the whole world does not know me, who am above the modes and inexhaustible. This divine energy of mine, consisting of the three modes of material nature, is difficult to overcome but those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. Those miscreants who are grossly foolish, lowest among mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and who partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. O best among the Bharatas, Arjuna, four kinds of pious men render devotional service unto me, the distressed, the desirer of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the absolute, of these, the wise one, who is in full knowledge in union with me through pure devotional service, is the best, for I am very dear to him, and he is dear to me. All these devotees are undoubtedly magnanimous souls, but he who is situated in knowledge of me I consider verily to dwell in me. Being engaged in my transcendental service, he attains me. After many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. I am in everyone's heart as the super soul. As soon as one desires to worship the demigods, I make his faith steady so that he can devote himself to some particular deity. Endowed with such faith, he seeks favors of a particular demigod and obtains his desires. But in actuality, these benefits are bestowed by me alone. Men of small intelligence worship the demigods, and their fruits are limited and temporary. Those who worship the demigods go to the planets of the demigods, but my devotees ultimately reach my supreme planet. Unintelligent men, who know me not, think that I have assumed this form and personality. Due to their small knowledge, they do not know my higher nature, which is changeless and supreme. I am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency, Yoga Maya. And so the deluded world knows me not, who am unborn and infallible. O Arjun, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know everything that has happened in the past, all that is happening in the present, and all things that are yet to come. I also know all living entities, but me no one knows. O scion of Bartha Arjuna, O conqueror of the foe, all living entities are born into delusion, overcome by the dualities of desire and hate. Persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life, whose sinful actions are completely eradicated and who are freed from the duality of delusion, engage themselves in my service with determination. Intelligent persons who are endeavoring for liberation from old age and death take refuge in me in devotional service. They are actually Brahman because they entirely know everything about transcendental and fruitive activities. Those who know me as the Supreme Lord, as the governing principle of the material manifestation, 
who know me as the one underlying all the demigods and as the one sustaining all sacrifices, can with steadfast mind understand and know me even at the time of death. Chapter 8 Attaining the Supreme Arjuna inquired, O my Lord, O Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the Self? What are fruitive activities? What is this material manifestation? And what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. How does this Lord of Sacrifice live in the body? And in which part does he live, O Madhusudana? And how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? The Supreme Lord said, The indestructible, transcendental living entity is called Brahman, and his eternal nature is called the Self. Action pertaining to the development of these material bodies is called karma, or fruit of activities. Physical nature is known to be endlessly mutable. The universe is the cosmic form of the Supreme Lord, and I am that Lord represented as the Super Soul, dwelling in the heart of every embodied being. And whoever at the time of death quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this there is no doubt. Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, that state he will attain without fail. Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna, and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activities dedicated to me, and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without doubt. He who meditates on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated from the path, he, O Partha, Arjuna, is sure to reach me. One should meditate upon the Supreme Person as the one who knows everything, as he who is the oldest, who is the controller, who is smaller than the smallest, who is the maintainer of everything, who is beyond all material conception, who is inconceivable, and who is always a person. He is luminous like the sun, and being transcendental is beyond this material nature. One who at the time of death fixes his life air between the eyebrows and in full devotion engages himself in remembering the Supreme Lord will certainly attain to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Persons learned in the Vedas who utter omkara and who are great sages in the renounced order enter Brahman. Desiring such perfection, one practices celibacy. I shall now explain to you this process by which one may attain salvation. The yogic situation is that of detachment from all sensual engagements. Closing all the doors of the senses and fixing the mind on the heart and the life air at the top of the head, one establishes himself in yoga. After being situated in this yoga practice and vibrating the sacred syllable OM, the supreme combination of letters, if one thinks of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and quits his body, he will certainly reach the spiritual planets. For one who remembers me without deviation, I am easy to obtain, O son of Pritha, because of his constant engagement in devotional service. After attaining me, the great souls who are yogis in devotion never return to this temporary world, which is full of miseries, because they have attained the highest perfection. From the highest planet in the material world, down to the lowest, all are places of misery wherein repeated birth and death take place. But one who attains to my abode, O son of Kunti, never takes birth again. By human calculation, a thousand ages taken together is the duration of Brahma's one day, and such also is the duration of his night. When Brahma's day is manifest, this multitude of living entities comes into being and at the arrival of Brahma's night, they are all annihilated. Again and again the day comes, and this host of beings is active, and again the night falls of Partha, and they are helplessly dissolved. Yet there is another nature, which is eternal, and is transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested matter. 
It is supreme and never annihilated. When all this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. That supreme abode is called unmanifested and infallible. It is the supreme destination. When one goes there, he never comes back. That is my supreme abode. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is greater than all, is attainable by unalloyed devotion. Although he is present in his abode, he is all-pervading, and everything is situated within him. O best of the Bharatas, I shall now explain to you the different times at which, passing away from this world, one does or does not come back. Those who know the Supreme Brahman pass away from the world during the influence of the fiery god, in the light, at an auspicious moment, during the fortnight of the moon, and the six months when the sun travels in the north. The mystic who passes away from this world during the smoke, the night, the moonlight fortnight, or in the six months when the sun passes to the south, or who reaches the moon planet, again comes back. According to the Vedas, there are two ways of passing from this world, one in light and one in darkness. When one passes in light, he does not come back, but when one passes in darkness, he returns. The devotees who know these two paths, O Arjun, are never bewildered. Therefore, be always fixed in devotion. A person who accepts the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, performing austere sacrifices, giving charity, or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. At the end, he reaches the supreme abode. Chapter 9 The Most Confidential Knowledge The Supreme Lord said, My dear Arjuna, because you are never envious of me, I shall impart to you this most secret wisdom, knowing which you shall be relieved of all the miseries of material existence. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge, and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting, and it is joyfully performed. Those who are not faithful on the path of devotional service cannot attain me, O conqueror of foes, but return to birth and death in this material world. By me in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. And yet everything that is created does not rest in me. Behold my mystic opulence. Although I am the maintainer of all living entities, and although I am everywhere, still myself is the very source of creation. As the mighty wind blowing everywhere always rests in ethereal space, Know that in the same manner all beings rest in me. O son of Kunti, at the end of the millennium, every material manifestation enters into my nature. At the beginning of another millennium, by my potency, I again create. The whole cosmic order is under me. By my will it is manifested again and again, and by my will it is annihilated at the end. O Dhananjaya, all this work cannot bind me. I am ever detached, seated as though neutral. This material nature is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, and it is producing all moving and unmoving beings. By its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. Fools deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. Those who are thus bewildered are attracted by demoniac and atheistic views. In that deluded condition, their hopes for liberation, their fruit of activities, and their culture of knowledge are all defeated. O son of Pritta, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me, these great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. Others who are engaged in the cultivation of knowledge worship the Supreme Lord 
as the one without a second, diverse in many and in the universal form. But it is I who am the ritual, I the sacrifice, the offering to the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant. I am the butter and the fire and the offering. I am the father of this universe, the mother, the support, and the grandsire. I am the object of knowledge, the purifier, and the syllable om. I am also the rig, the sama, and the yajur vedas. I am the goal, the sustainer, the master, the witness, the abode, the refuge, and the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis of everything, the resting place, and the eternal seed. O Arjuna, I control heat, the rain, and the drought. I am immortality, and I am also death personified. Both being and non-being are in me. Those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly. They take birth on the planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. When they have thus enjoyed heavenly sense pleasure, they return to this mortal planet again. Thus, through the Vedic principles, they achieve only flickering happiness. But those who worship me with devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. Whatever a man may sacrifice to other gods, O son of Kunti, is really meant for me alone, but it is offered without true understanding. I am the only enjoyer and the only object of sacrifice. Those who do not recognize my true transcendental nature fall down. Those who worship the demigods will take birth among the demigods. Those who worship ghosts and spirits will take birth among such beings. Those who worship the ancestors go to the ancestors, and those who worship me will live with me. If one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it. O son of Kunti, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities that you may perform, should be done as an offering unto me. In this way you will be freed from all reactions to good and evil deeds. And by this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all, but whoever renders service unto me, in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. Even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated. He quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. O son of Pritha, those who take shelter in me, though they be of lower birth, women, vaishas, merchants, as well as sudras, workers, can approach the supreme destination. How much greater then are the brahmanas, the righteous, the devotees and saintly kings, who in this temporary miserable world engage in loving service unto me. Engage your mind always in thinking of me, offer obeisances and worship me. Being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Chapter 10, The Opulence of the Absolute The Supreme Lord said, my dear friend, mighty armed Arjun, listen again to my supreme word, which I shall impart to you for your benefit and which will give you great joy. Neither the hosts of demigods nor the great sages know my origin, for in every respect, I am the source of the demigods and the sages. He who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the supreme Lord of all the worlds, he undiluted among men, is freed from all sins. Intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, forgiveness, truthfulness, self-control and calmness, pleasure and pain, birth, death, fear, fearlessness, non-violence, equanimity, satisfaction, austerity, charity, fame and infamy are created by me alone. The seven great sages and before them the four other great sages and the Manus, progenitors of mankind, are born out of my mind. 
and all creatures in these planets descend from them. He who knows in truth this glory and power of mine engages in unalloyed devotional service. Of this there is no doubt. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are surrendered to me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss, enlightening one another and conversing about me. To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. Out of compassion for them, I, dwelling in their hearts, destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. Arjuna said, You are the supreme Brahman, the ultimate, the supreme abode and purifier, the absolute truth and the eternal divine person. You are the primal God, transcendental and original, and you are the unborn and all-pervading beauty. All the great sages such as Narada, Asita, Devala and Vyas proclaim this of you, and now you yourself are declaring it to me. O Krishna, I totally accept as truth all that you have told me. Neither the gods nor demons, O Lord, know thy personality. Indeed, you alone know yourself by your own potencies, O origin of all, Lord of all beings, God of gods, O supreme person, Lord of the universe. Please tell me in detail of your divine powers by which you pervade all these worlds and abide in them. How should I meditate on you? In what various forms are you to be contemplated, O blessed Lord? Tell me again in detail, O Janardana, Krishna, of your mighty potencies and glories, for I never tire of hearing your ambrosial words. The blessed Lord said, Yes, I will tell you of my splendorous manifestations, but only of those which are prominent, O Arjun, for my opulence is limitless. I am the Self, O Gudakesha, seated in the hearts of all creatures. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings. Of the Adityas, I am Vishnu. Of lights, I am the radiant sun. I am Marichi of the Maruts, and among the stars, I am the moon. Of the Vedas, I am the Samaveda. Of the demigods, I am Indra. Of the senses, I am the mind. And in living beings, I am the living force, knowledge. Of all the Rudras, I am Lord Shiva. Of the Yakshas and Rakshashas, I am the Lord of Wealth, Kuvera. And of the Vasus, I am Fire, Agni. And of the mountains, I am Meru. Of priests, O Arjuna, know me to be the chief, Brihaspati, the Lord of Devotion. Of generals, I am Skanda, the lord of war. And of bodies of water, I am the ocean. Of the great sages, I am Brigu. Of vibrations, I am the transcendental Om. Of sacrifices, I am the chanting of the holy names, Japa. And of immovable things, I am the Himalayas. Of all trees, I am the holy fig tree. And amongst sages and demigods, I am Narada. Of the singers of gods, Gandharvas, I am Chitra Ratha. And among perfected beings, I am the sage Kapila. Of horses know me to be Uchai Shrava, who rose out of the ocean, born of the elixir of immortality. Of lordly elephants, I am Airavata. And among men, I am the monarch. Of weapons, I am the thunderbolt. Among cows, I am the Surabi, giver of abundant milk. Of procreators, I am Kandarpa, the god of love. And of serpents, I am Vasuki, the chief. Of celestial Naga snakes, I am Ananta. Of the aquatic deities, I am Varuna. Of departed ancestors, I am Aryama. And among the dispensers of law, I am Yama, the lord of death. Among the Daicha demons, I am the devoted Prahlad. Among subduers, I am time. And among the beasts, I am the lion. Among birds, I am Garuda, the feathered carrier of Vishnu. Of purifiers, I am the wind. Of the wielders of weapons, I am Rama. Of fishes, I am the shark. And of flowing rivers, I am the Ganges. Of all creations, I am the beginning and the end, and also the middle, O Arjun. Of all sciences, I am the spiritual science of the self. 
and among logicians, I am the conclusive truth. Of letters, I am the letter A, and among compounds, I am the dual word. I am also inexhaustible time, and of creators, I am Brahma, whose many-fold faces turn everywhere. I am all devouring death, and I am the generator of all things yet to be. Among women, I am fame, fortune, speech, memory, intelligence, faithfulness, and patience. Of hymns, I am the Brihat Sama, sung to the Lord Indra, and of poetry, I am the Gayatri verse, sung daily by Brahmanas. Of months, I am November and December, and of seasons, I am flower-bearing spring. I am also the gambling of cheats, and of the splendid, I am the splendor. I am victory, I am adventure, and I am the strength of the strong. Of the descendants of Vrishni, I am Vasudev, and of the Pandavas, I am Arjun. Of the sages, I am Vyas, and among great thinkers, I am Ushana. Among punishments, I am the rod of chastisement, and of those who seek victory, I am morality. Of secret things, I am silence, and of the wise, I am wisdom. Furthermore, O Arjuna, I am the generating seed of all existence. There is no being, moving or unmoving, that can exist without me. O mighty conqueror of enemies, there is no end to my divine manifestations. What I have spoken to you is but a mere indication of my infinite opulences. Know that all beautiful, glorious, and mighty creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. But what need is there, Arjun, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. Chapter 11 The Universal Form Arjuna said, I have heard your instruction on confidential spiritual matters, which you have so kindly delivered unto me, and my illusion is now dispelled. O lotus-eyed one, I have heard from you in detail about the appearance and disappearance of every living entity, as realized through your inexhaustible glories. O greatest of all personalities, O supreme form, Though I see here before me your actual position, I yet wish to see how you have entered into this cosmic manifestation. I want to see that form of yours. If you think that I am able to behold your cosmic form, O my Lord, O Master of all mystic power, then kindly show me that universal self. The Blessed Lord said, My dear Arjun, O son of Pritha, behold now my opulence, hundreds of thousands of varied divine forms, multicolored like the sea. O best of the Bhartas, see here the different manifestations of Adityas, Rudras, and all the demigods. Behold the many things which no one has ever seen or heard before. Whatever you wish to see can be seen all at once in this body. This universal form can show you all that you now desire, as well as whatever you may desire in the future. Everything is here completely. But you cannot see me with your present eyes. Therefore I give you divine eyes by which you can behold my mystic opulence. Sanjaya said, O King, speaking thus, the Supreme, the Lord of all mystic power, the Personality of Godhead, displayed his universal form to Arjuna. Arjuna saw in that universal form unlimited mouths and unlimited eyes. It was all wondrous. The form was decorated with divine, dazzling ornaments and arrayed in many garbs. He was garlanded gloriously, and there were many scents smeared over his body. All was magnificent, all expanding, unlimited. This was seen by Arjun. If hundreds of thousands of suns rose up at once into the sky, they might resemble the effulgence of the Supreme Person in that universal form. At that time, Arjuna could see in the universal form of the Lord the unlimited expansions of the universe, situated in one place, although divided into many, many thousands. Then bewildered and astonished, his hair standing on end, Arjuna began to pray with folded hands, offering obeisances to the Supreme Lord. Arjuna said, 
My dear Lord Krishna, I see assembled together in your body all the demigods and various other living entities. I see Brahma sitting on the lotus flower, as well as Lord Shiva and many sages and divine serpents. O Lord of the universe, I see in your universal body many, many forms, bellies, mouths, eyes, expanded without limit. There is no end, there is no beginning, and there is no middle to all this. Your form adorned with various crowns, clubs, and discs is difficult to see because of its glaring effulgence, which is fiery and immeasurable like the sun. You are the supreme primal objective. You are the best in all the universes. You are inexhaustible, and you are the oldest. You are the maintainer of religion, the eternal personality of Godhead. You are the origin without beginning, middle, or end. You have numberless arms, and the sun and moon are among your great unlimited eyes. By your own radiance, you are heating this entire universe. Although you are one, you are spread throughout the sky and the planets and all space between. O Great One, as I behold this terrible form, I see that all the planetary systems are perplexed. All the demigods are surrendering and entering into you. They are very much afraid, and with folded hands they are singing the Vedic hymns. The different manifestations of Lord Shiva, the Adityas, the Vashus, the Sadyas, and the Vishvadevas, the two Ashvins, the Maruts, the Forefathers, and the Gandharvas, the Yakshas, Asuras, and all perfected demigods are beholding you in wonder. O mighty armed one, all the planets with their demigods are disturbed at seeing your many faces, eyes, arms, bellies, and legs, and your terrible teeth. As they are disturbed, so am I. O all-pervading Vishnu, I can no longer maintain my equilibrium. Seeing your radiant colors fill the skies and beholding your eyes and mouths, I am afraid. O Lord of lords, O refuge of the worlds, please be gracious to me. I cannot keep my balance seeing thus your blazing death-like faces and awful teeth. In all directions I am bewildered. All the sons of Dhritarashtra, along with their allied kings and Bhishma, Drona and Karna and all our soldiers are rushing into your mouths their heads smashed by your fearful teeth. I see that some are being crushed between your teeth as well. As rivers flow into the sea, so all these great warriors enter your blazing mouths and perish. I see all people rushing with full speed into your mouths as moths dash into a blazing fire. O Vishnu, I see you're devouring all people in your flaming mouths and covering the universe with your immeasurable rays scorching the worlds you are manifest. O Lord of Lords, so fierce of form, please tell me who you are. I offer my obeisances unto you. Please be gracious to me. I do not know what your mission is, and I desire to hear of it. The Blessed Lord said, Time I am, destroyer of the worlds, and I have come to engage all people. With the exception of you, the Pandavas, all the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Therefore, get up and prepare to fight. After conquering your enemies, you will enjoy a flourishing kingdom. They are already put to death by my arrangement, and you, O Savya Sachin, can be but an instrument in the fight. The Blessed Lord said, All the great warriors, Drona, Bhishma, Jayadrath, Karna, are already destroyed. Simply fight and you will vanquish your enemies. Sanjaya said to Dhritarashtra, O king, after hearing these words from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Arjuna trembled, fearfully offered obeisances with folded hands, and began falteringly to speak as follows. O Rishikesh, the world becomes joyful upon hearing your name, and thus everyone becomes attached to you. Although the perfected beings offer you their respectful homage, the demons are afraid, and they flee here and there. All this is rightly done. O great one who stands above even Brahma, you are the original master. Why should they not offer their homage up to you, O limitless one, O refuge of the universe? You are the invincible source, the cause of all causes, transcendental to this material manifestation. You are the original personality of Godhead. 
You are the only sanctuary of this manifested cosmic world. You know everything, and you are all that is knowable. You are above the material modes, O oh, limitless form. This whole cosmic manifestation is pervaded by you. You are air, fire, water, and you are the moon. You are the supreme controller and the grandfather. Thus I offer my respectful obeisances unto you a thousand times and again and yet again. Obeisances from the front, from behind, and from all sides. O oh, unabounded power, you are the master of limitless might. You are all-pervading and thus you are everything. In the past I have addressed you as O Krishna, O Yadava, O my friend, without knowing your glories. Please forgive whatever I may have done in madness or in love. I have dishonored you many times while relaxing or while lying on the same bed or eating together, sometimes alone and sometimes in front of many friends. Please excuse me for all my offenses. You are the father of this complete cosmic manifestation, the worshipable chief, the spiritual master. No one is equal to you, nor can anyone be one with you. Within the three worlds, you are immeasurable. You are the Supreme Lord to be worshipped by every living being. Thus I fall down to offer you my respects and ask your mercy. Please tolerate the wrongs that I may have done to you and bear with me as a father with a son, or a friend with his friend, or a lover with his beloved. After seeing this universal form, which I have never seen before, I am gladdened but at the same time my mind is disturbed with fear. Therefore, please bestow your grace upon me and reveal again your form as the personality of Godhead, O Lord of Lords, O abode of the universe. O Universal Lord, I wish to see you in your forearmed form, with helmeted head and with club, wheel, conch, and lotus flower in your hands. I long to see you in that form. The Blessed Lord said, my dear Arjuna, happily do I show you this universal form within the material world by my internal potency. No one before you has ever seen this unlimited and glaringly effulgent form. O best of the Kuru warriors, no one before you has ever seen this universal form of mine. For neither by studying the Vedas, nor by performing sacrifices, nor by charities or similar activities, can this form be seen. Only you have seen this. Your mind has been perturbed upon seeing this horrible feature of mine. Now let it be finished. My devotee, be free from all disturbance. With a peaceful mind, you can now see the form you desire. Sanjaya said to Dhritarashtra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, while speaking thus to Arjuna, displayed his real four-armed form and at last he showed him his two-armed form, thus encouraging the fearful Arjuna. When Arjuna thus saw Krishna in his original form, he said, Seeing this human-like form so very beautiful, my mind is now pacified, and I am restored to my original nature. The blessed Lord said, My dear Arjuna, the form which you now are seeing is very difficult to behold, even the demigods are ever seeking the opportunity to see this form which is so dear. The form which you are seeing with your transcendental eyes cannot be understood simply by studying the Vedas, nor by undergoing serious penances, nor by charity, nor by worship. It is not by these means that one can see me as I am. My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. My dear Arjuna, one who is engaged in my pure devotional service, free from the contaminations of previous activities and from mental speculation, who is friendly to every living entity, certainly comes to me. Chapter 12 Devotional Service Arjuna inquired, Which is considered to be more perfect, those who are properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested? 
the Blessed Lord said, He whose mind is fixed on my personal form, always engaged in worshipping me with great and transcendental faith, is considered by me to be most perfect. But those who fully worship the unmanifested, that which lies beyond the perception of the senses, the all-pervading, inconceivable, fixed and immovable, the impersonal conception of the absolute truth, by controlling the various senses and being equally disposed to everyone, such persons, engaged in the welfare of all, at last achieve me. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested impersonal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. For one who worships me, giving up all his activities unto me, and being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service and always meditating upon me, who has fixed his mind upon me, O son of Pritta, for him I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. Just fix your mind upon me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and engage all your intelligence in me. Thus you will live in me always, without a doubt. My dear Arjuna, O winner of wealth, if you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, then follow the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga. In this way, you will develop a desire to attain to me. If you cannot practice the regulations of Bhakti Yoga, then just try to work for me, because by working for me, you will come to the perfect stage. If, however, you are unable to work in this consciousness, then try to act giving up all results of your work and try to be self-situated. If you cannot take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation, and better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action, for by such renunciation one can attain peace of mind. One who is not envious, but who is a friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor, who is free from false ego, and equal both in happiness and distress, who is always satisfied and engaged in devotional service with determination, and whose mind and intelligence are in agreement with me, he is very dear to me. He for whom no one is put into difficulty, and who is not disturbed by anxiety, who is steady in happiness and distress, is very dear to me. A devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities, who is pure, expert, without cares, free from all pains, and who does not strive for some result, is very dear to me. One who neither grasps pleasure or grief, who neither laments nor desires, and who renounces both auspicious and inauspicious things, is very dear to me. One who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equiposed in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, who is always free from contamination, always silent and satisfied with anything, who doesn't care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge and engaged in devotional service, is very dear to me. He who follows this imperishable path of devotional service and who completely engages himself with faith, making me the supreme goal, is very, very dear to me. Chapter 13 Nature, the Enjoyer, and Consciousness Arjuna said, O oh my dear Krishna, I wish to know about Prakriti, nature, Purusha, the enjoyer, and the field and the knower of the field, and of knowledge and the end of knowledge. The Blessed Lord then said, This body, O son of Kunti, is called the field, and one who knows this body is called the knower of the field. O scion of Bharata, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies, and to understand this body and its owner is called knowledge. That is my opinion. Now please hear my brief description of this field of activities and how it is constituted, what its changes are, whence it is produced, who that knower of the field of activities is, 
and what his influences are. That knowledge of the field of activities and of the knower of activities is described by various sages in various Vedic writings, especially in the Vedanta Sutra, and is presented with all reasoning as to cause and effect. The five great elements, false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, the ten senses, the mind, the five sense objects, desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms, and convictions. All these are considered in summary to be the field of activities and its interactions. Humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, steadiness, and self-control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age, and disease, non-attachment to children, wife, home, and the rest, and even-mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, resorting to solitary places, detachment from the general mass of people, accepting the importance of self-realization, and philosophical search for the absolute truth. All these I thus declare to be knowledge, and what is contrary to these is ignorance. I shall now explain the knowable, knowing which you will taste the eternal. This is beginningless, and it is subordinate to me. It is called Brahman, the spirit, and it lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. Everywhere are his hands and legs, his eyes and faces, and he hears everything. In this way, the Supersoul exists. The Supersoul is the original source of all senses, yet he is without senses. He is unattached, although he is the maintainer of all living beings. He transcends the modes of nature, and at the same time he is the master of all modes of material nature. The Supreme Truth exists both internally and externally in the moving and non-moving. He is beyond the power of the material senses to see or to know. Although far, far away, he is also near to all. Although the Supersoul appears to be divided, he is never divided. He is situated as one. Although he is the maintainer of every living entity, it is to be understood that he devours and develops all. He is the source of light in all luminous objects. He is beyond the darkness of matter and is unmanifested. He is knowledge. He is the object of knowledge. And he is the goal of knowledge. He is situated in everyone's heart. Thus the field of activities, the body, knowledge, and the knowable have been summarily described by me. Only my devotees can understand this thoroughly and thus attain to my nature. Material nature and the living entities should be understood to be beginningless. Their transformations and the modes of matter are products of material nature. Nature is said to be the cause of all material activities and effects, whereas the living entity is the cause of the various sufferings and enjoyments in this world. The living entity in material nature thus follows the ways of life, enjoying the three modes of nature. This is due to his association with that material nature. Thus he meets with good and evil amongst various species. Yet in this body there is another, a transcendental enjoyer who is the Lord, the supreme proprietor, who exists as the overseer and permitter and who is known as the Supersoul. One who understands this philosophy concerning material nature, the living entity, and the interaction of the modes of nature is sure to attain liberation. He will not take birth here again, regardless of his present position. That Supersoul is perceived by some through meditation, by some through the cultivation of knowledge, and by others through working without fruitive desire. 
Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge, begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about Him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the path of birth and death. O Chief of the Bhartas, whatever you see in existence, both moving and unmoving, is only the combination of the field of activities and the knower of the field. One who sees the Supersoul accompanying the individual soul in all bodies and who understands that neither the soul nor the Supersoul is ever destroyed actually sees. One who sees the Supersoul in every living being and equal everywhere does not degrade himself by his mind. Thus he approaches the transcendental destination. One who can see that all activities are performed by the body which is created of material nature and sees that the self does nothing actually sees. When a sensible man ceases to see different identities which are due to different material bodies, he attains to the Brahman conception. Thus he sees that beings are expanded everywhere. Those with the vision of eternity can see that the soul is transcendental, eternal, and beyond the modes of nature. Despite contact with the material body, O Arjun, the soul neither does anything nor is entangled. The sky, due to its subtle nature, does not mix with anything, although it is all-pervading. Similarly, the soul situated in Brahman vision does not mix with the body, though situated in that body. O son of Bharata, as the sun alone illuminates all this universe, so does the living entity, one within the body, illuminate the entire body by consciousness. One who knowingly sees this difference between the body and the owner of the body and can understand the process of liberation from this bondage also attains to the supreme goal. Chapter 14 The Three Modes of Material Nature The Blessed Lord said, Again I shall declare to you this supreme wisdom, the best of all knowledge, knowing which all the sages have attained to supreme perfection. By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain to the transcendental nature, which is like my own nature. Thus established, one is not born at the time of creation nor disturbed at the time of dissolution. The total material substance, called Brahman, is the source of birth, and it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making possible the births of all living beings, O son of Bharata. It should be understood that all species of life, O son of Kunti, are made possible by birth in this material nature, and that I am the seed-giving father. Material nature consists of the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. When the living entity comes in contact with nature, he becomes conditioned by these modes. O sinless one, the mode of goodness, being purer than the others, is illuminating, and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode develop knowledge, but they become conditioned by the concept of happiness. The mode of passion is born of unlimited desires and longings, O son of Kunti, and because of this, one is bound to material fruit of activities. O son of Bharata, the mode of ignorance causes the delusion of all living entities. The result of this mode is madness, indolence, and sleep, which bind the conditioned soul. The mode of goodness conditions one to happiness, Passion conditions him to the fruits of action, and ignorance to madness. Sometimes the mode of passion becomes prominent, defeating the mode of goodness, O son of Bharata. And sometimes the mode of goodness defeats passion, and at other times the mode of ignorance defeats goodness and passion. In this way there is always competition for supremacy. The manifestations of the mode of goodness can be experienced when all the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge. 
O chief of the Bharatas, when there is an increase in the mode of passion, the symptoms of great attachment, uncontrollable desire, hankering, and intense endeavor develop. O son of Kuru, when there is an increase in the mode of ignorance, madness, illusion, inertia, and darkness are manifested. When one dies in the mode of goodness, he attains to the pure higher planets. When one dies in the mode of passion, he takes birth among those engaged in fruitive activities. And when he dies in the mode of ignorance, he takes birth in the animal kingdom. By acting in the mode of goodness, one becomes purified. Works done in the mode of passion result in distress, and actions performed in the mode of ignorance result in foolishness. From the mode of goodness, real knowledge develops. From the mode of passion, grief develops. And from the mode of ignorance, foolishness, madness, and illusion develop. Those situated in the mode of goodness gradually go upward to the higher planets. Those in the mode of passion live on the earthly planets, and those in the mode of ignorance go down to the hellish worlds. When you see that there is nothing beyond these modes of nature in all activities, and that the Supreme Lord is transcendental to all these modes, then you can know my spiritual nature. When the embodied being is able to transcend these three modes, he can become free from birth, death, old age, and their distresses, and can enjoy nectar even in this life. Arjuna inquired, O oh my dear Lord, by what symptoms is one known who is transcendental to these modes? What is his behavior, and how does he transcend the modes of nature? The blessed Lord said, He who does not hate illumination, attachment, and delusion when they are present, nor longs for them when they disappear, who is seated like one unconcerned, being situated beyond these material reactions and the modes of nature, who remains firm, knowing that the modes alone are active, who regards alike pleasure and pain, who looks on a clod, a stone, a piece of gold with an equal eye, who is wise and holds praise and blame to be the same, who is unchanged in honor and dishonor, who treats a friend and foe alike, who has abandoned all fruit of undertakings. Such a man is said to have transcended the modes of nature. One who engages in full devotional service, who does not fall down in any circumstance, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. And I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman, which is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness and which is immortal imperishable and eternal. Chapter 15 The Yoga of the Supreme Person The Blessed Lord said, There is a banyan tree which has its roots upward and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. One who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. The branches of this tree extend downward and upward, nourished by the three modes of material nature. The twigs are the objects of the senses. This tree also has roots going down, and these are bound to the fruits of actions of human society. The real form of this tree cannot be perceived in this world. No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is. But with determination, one must cut down this tree with the weapon of detachment. So doing, one must seek that place from which, having once gone, one never returns, and there surrender to that supreme personality of Godhead from whom everything has begun and in whom everything is abiding since time immemorial. One who is free from illusion, false prestige, and false association, who understands the eternal, who is done with material lust, and is freed from the duality of happiness and distress, and who knows how to surrender unto the Supreme Person, attains to that eternal kingdom. That abode of mine is not illumined by the sun or moon, nor by electricity. One who reaches it never returns to this material world. 
Living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal fragmental parts. Due to conditioned life, they are struggling very hard with the six senses, which include the mind. The living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another, as the air carries aromas. The living entity, thus taking another gross body, obtains a certain type of ear, tongue, and nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind. He thus enjoys a particular set of sense objects. The foolish cannot understand how a living entity can quit his body, nor can they understand what sort of body he enjoys under the spell of the modes of nature. But one whose eyes are trained in knowledge can see all this. The endeavoring transcendentalist, who is situated in self-realization, can see all this clearly. But those who are not situated in self-realization cannot see what is taking place, though they may try to. The splendor of the sun which dissipates the darkness of this whole world comes from me, and the splendor of the moon and the splendor of fire are also from me. I enter into each planet, and by my energy they stay in orbit. I become the moon and thereby supply the juice of life to all vegetables. I am the fire of digestion in every living body, and I am the air of life, outgoing and incoming, by which I digest the four kinds of foodstuff. I am seated in everyone's heart, and from me comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. By all the Vedas am I to be known. Indeed, I am the compiler of the Vedanta, and I am the knower of the Vedas. There are two classes of beings, the fallible and the infallible. In the material world, every entity is fallible, and in the spiritual world, every entity is called infallible. Besides these two, there is the greatest living personality, the Lord himself, who has entered into these worlds and is maintaining them. Because I am transcendental, beyond both the fallible and the infallible, and because I am the greatest, I am celebrated both in the world and in the Vedas as that Supreme Person. Whoever knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, without doubting, is to be understood as the knower of everything, and he therefore engages himself in full devotional service, O son of Bharata. This is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures, O sinless one, and it is disclosed now by me. Whoever understands this will become wise, and his endeavors will know perfection. Chapter 16 The Divine and Demoniac Natures the Blessed Lord said, Fearlessness, purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Vedas, austerity and simplicity, non-violence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault-finding, compassion, and freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, and steady determination, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, freedom from envy, and the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, O son of Bharata, belong to godly men endowed with divine nature. Arrogance, pride, anger, conceit, harshness, and ignorance, these qualities belong to those of demoniac nature, O son of Pritha. The transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. O son of Pritha, in this world there are two kinds of created beings. One is called the divine and the other demoniac. I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demoniac. Those who are demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Neither cleanliness nor proper behavior nor truth is found in them. They say that this world is unreal, that there is no foundation, 
and that there is no God in control. It is produced of sex desire and has no cause other than lust. Following such conclusions, the demoniac, who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence, engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. The demoniac taking shelter of insatiable lust, pride, and false prestige, and thus being illusioned, are always sworn to unclean work attracted by the impermanent. They believe that to gratify the senses unto the end of life is the prime necessity of human civilization. Thus there is no end to their anxiety. Being bound by hundreds and thousands of desires, by lust and anger, they secure money by illegal means for sense gratification. The demoniac person thinks, so much wealth do I have today, and I will gain more according to my schemes. So much is mine now, and it will increase in the future more and more. He is my enemy, and I have killed him, and my other enemy will also be killed. I am the Lord of everything. I am the enjoyer. I am perfect, powerful, and happy. I am the richest man surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is none so powerful and happy as I am. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity, and thus I shall rejoice. In this way, such persons are deluded by ignorance. Thus perplexed by various anxieties and bound by a network of illusions, one becomes too strongly attached to sense enjoyment and falls down into hell. Self-complacent and always impudent, deluded by wealth and false prestige, they sometimes perform sacrifices in name only, without following any rules or regulations. Bewildered by false ego, strength, pride, lust and anger, the demon becomes envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is situated in his own body and in the bodies of others, and blasphemes against the real religion. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life. Attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, such persons can never approach me. Gradually they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. There are three gates leading to this hell, lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up, for they lead to the degradation of the soul. The man who has escaped these three gates of hell, O son of Kunti, performs acts conducive to self-realization and thus gradually attains the supreme destination. But he who discards scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination. One should understand what is duty and what is not duty by the regulations of the scriptures. Knowing such rules and regulations, one should act so that he may gradually be elevated. Chapter 17 The Divisions of Faith Arjuna said, O Krishna, what is the situation of one who does not follow the principles of Scripture, but worships according to his own imagination? Is he in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? The Supreme Lord said, According to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be of three kinds, goodness, passion, or ignorance. Now hear about these. According to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. The living being is said to be of a particular faith according to the modes he has acquired. Men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods. Those in the mode of passion worship the demons. And those in the mode of ignorance worship ghosts and spirits. Those who undergo severe austerities and penances not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride, egotism, lust, and attachment, who are impelled by passion and who torture their bodily organs as well as the supersoul dwelling within, are to be known as demons. 
Even food of which all partake is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifice, austerities, and charity. Listen, and I shall tell you of the distinctions of these. Food in the mode of goodness increases the duration of life, purify one's existence, and gives strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such nourishing foods are sweet, juicy, fattening, and palatable. Foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, pungent, dry, and hot are liked by people in the modes of passion. Such foods cause pain, distress, and disease. Food cooked more than three hours before being eaten, which is tasteless, stale, putrid, decomposed, and unclean, is food liked by people in the mode of ignorance. Of sacrifices, that sacrifice performed according to duty and to scriptural rules, and with no expectation of reward, is of the nature of goodness. But that sacrifice performed for some material end, or benefit, or performed ostentatiously, out of pride, is of the nature of passion, or chief of the Bharatas. And that sacrifice performed in defiance of scriptural injunctions, in which no spiritual food is distributed, no hymns are chanted, and no remunerations are made to the priests, and which is faithless, that sacrifice is of the nature of ignorance. The austerity of the body consists in this, worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmanas, the spiritual master, and superiors like the father and mother. Cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and non-violence are also austerities of the body. Austerity of speech consists in speaking truthfully and beneficially and avoiding speech that offends. One should also recite the Vedas regularly. And serenity, simplicity, gravity, self-control, and purity of thought are the austerities of the mind. This threefold austerity practiced by men whose aim is not to benefit themselves materially but to please the Supreme is of the nature of goodness. Those ostentatious penances and austerities which are performed in order to gain respect, honor, and reverence are said to be in the mode of passion. They are neither stable nor permanent. And those penances and austerities which are performed foolishly by means of obstinate self-torture or to destroy or injure others are said to be in the mode of ignorance. That gift which is given out of duty at the proper time and place to a worthy person and without expectation of return is considered to be charity in the mode of goodness. But charity performed with the expectation of some return or with a desire for fruit of results or in a grudging mood is said to be charity in the mode of passion. And charity performed at an improper place and time and given to unworthy persons without respect and with contempt is charity in the mode of ignorance. From the beginning of creation, the three syllables Om Tat Sat have been used to indicate the supreme absolute truth, Brahman. They were uttered by Brahmanas while chanting Vedic hymns and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the supreme. Thus the transcendentalists undertake sacrifices, charities, and penances, beginning always with Om, to attain the supreme. One should perform sacrifice, penance, and charity with the word tat. The purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from the material entanglement. The absolute truth is the objective of devotional service, and it is indicated by the word sat. These works of sacrifice, of penance, and of charity, true to the absolute nature, are performed to please the Supreme Person, O Son of Pritha. But sacrifices, austerities, and charities performed without faith in the Supreme are non-permanent, O Son of Pritha, regardless of whatever rites are performed. They are called asat and are useless both in this life and the next. Chapter 18 Conclusion The Perfection of Renunciation Arjuna said, O mighty armed one, I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation, tyag, 
and of the renounced order of life, Sinyas, O killer of the Keshi demon, Rishi Kesh. The Supreme Lord said, To give up the result of all activities is called renunciation, Tiag, by the wise. And that state is called the renounced order of life, Sanyas, by great learned men. Some learned men declare that all kinds of fruit of activities should be given up. But there are yet other sages who maintain that the acts of sacrifice, charity, and penance should never be abandoned. O best of the Bharatas, hear from me now about renunciation. O tiger among men, there are three kinds of renunciation declared in the scriptures. Acts of sacrifice, charity, and penance are not to be given up, but should be performed. Indeed, sacrifice, charity, and penance purify even the great souls. All these activities should be performed without any expectation of result. They should be performed as a matter of duty, O son of Pritha. That is my final opinion. Prescribed duties should never be renounced. If, by illusion, one gives up his prescribed duties, such renunciation is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Anyone who gives up prescribed duties as troublesome or out of fear is said to be in the mode of passion. Such action never leads to the elevation of renunciation. But he who performs his prescribed duties only because it ought to be done and renounces all attachment to the fruit, his renunciation is of the nature of goodness, O Arjuna. Those who do not hate any inauspicious work, nor are attached to auspicious work situated in the mode of goodness, have no doubts about work. It is indeed impossible for an embodied being to give up all activities. Therefore it is said that he who renounces the fruits of action is one who has truly renounced. For one who is not renounced, the threefold fruits of action, desirable, undesirable, and mixed, accrue after death. But those who are in the renounced order of life have no such results to suffer or enjoy. O mighty armed Arjun, Learn from me of the five factors which bring about the accomplishment of all action. These are declared in Sankhya philosophy to be the place of action, the performer, the senses, the endeavor, and ultimately the super-soul. Whatever right or wrong action a man performs by body, mind, or speech is caused by these five factors. Therefore, one who thinks himself the only doer, not considering the five factors, is certainly not very intelligent and cannot see things as they are. One who is not motivated by false ego, whose intelligence is not entangled, though he kills men in this world, is not the slayer, nor is he bound by his actions. Knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower are the three factors which motivate action. The senses, the work, and the doer comprise the threefold basis of action. In accordance with the three modes of material nature, there are three kinds of knowledge, action, and performers of action. Listen as I describe them. That knowledge by which undivided spiritual nature is seen in all existence, undivided in the divided, is knowledge in the mode of goodness. That knowledge by which a different type of living entity is seen to be dwelling in different bodies is knowledge in the mode of passion. And that knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work as the all-in-all, all, without knowledge of the truth, and which is very meager, is said to be in the mode of darkness. As for actions, that action in accordance with duty, which is performed without attachment, without love or hate, by one who has renounced fruit of results, is called action in the mode of goodness. But action performed with great effort by one seeking to gratify his desires, and which is enacted from a sense of false ego, is called action in the mode of passion. And that action performed in ignorance and delusion, without consideration of future bondage or consequences, which inflicts injury and is impractical, is said to be action in the mode of ignorance. The worker who is free from all material attachments and false ego who is enthusiastic and resolute, and who is indifferent to success or failure, is a worker in the mode of goodness. But that worker who is attached to the fruits of his labor, and who passionately wants to enjoy them, 
who is greedy, envious, and impure, and moved by happiness and distress, is a worker in the mode of passion. And that worker who is always engaged in work against the injunctions of the scripture, who is materialistic, obstinate, cheating, and expert in insulting others, who is lazy, always morose, and procrastinating, is a worker in the mode of ignorance. Now, O winner of wealth, please listen as I tell you in detail of the three kinds of understanding and determination according to the three modes of nature. O son of Pritha, that understanding by which one knows what ought to be done and what ought not to be done, what is to be feared and what is not to be feared, what is binding and what is liberating, that understanding is established in the mode of goodness. And that understanding which cannot distinguish between religious way of life and the irreligious, between action that should be done and action that should not be done, that imperfect understanding, O son of Pritha, is in the mode of passion. That understanding which considers irreligion to be religion and religion to be irreligion, under the spell of illusion and darkness, and strives always in the wrong direction, O Partha, is in the mode of ignorance. O son of Pritha, that determination which is unbreakable, which is sustained with steadfastness by yoga practice, and thus controls the mind, life, and the acts of the senses, is in the mode of goodness. And that determination by which one holds fast a fruit of result in religion, economic development, and sense gratification is of the nature of passion, O Arjuna. And that determination which cannot go beyond dreaming, fearfulness, lamentation, moroseness, and illusion, such unintelligent determination is in the mode of darkness. O best of the Bhartas, now please hear from me about the three kinds of happiness which the conditioned soul enjoys, and by which he sometimes comes to the end of all distress. That which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar, and which awakens one to self-realization, is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. That happiness which is derived from contact of the senses with their objects, and which appears like nectar at first, but poison at the end, is said to be of the nature of passion. And that happiness which is blind to self-realization, which is delusion from beginning to end, and which rises from sleep, laziness, and illusion, is said to be of the nature of ignorance. There is no being existing either here or among the demigods in the higher planetary systems, which is freed from the three modes of material nature. Brahmanas, Chatriyas, Vaishas, and Shudras are distinguished by their qualities of work, O chastiser of the enemy, in accordance with the modes of nature. Peacefulness, self-control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, wisdom, knowledge, and religiousness, these are the qualities by which the brahmanas work. Heroism, power, determination, resourcefulness, courage in battle, generosity, and leadership are the qualities of the work for the Kshatriyas. Farming, cattle raising, and business are the qualities of work for the Vaishas, and for the Shudras there is labor and service to others. By following his qualities of work, every man can become perfect. Now please hear from me how this can be done. By worship of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all-pervading, man can, in the performance of his own duty, attain perfection. It is better to engage in one's own occupation even though one may perform it imperfectly, than to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. Prescribed duties according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reaction. Every endeavor is covered by some sort of fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. Therefore, one should not give up the work which is born of his nature, O son of Kunti, even if such work is full of fault. One can obtain the results of renunciation simply by self-control and by becoming unattached to material things and disregarding material enjoyments. 
That is the highest perfectional stage of renunciation. O son of Kunti, learn from me in brief how one can attain to the supreme perfectional stage, Brahman, by acting in the way which I shall now summarize. Being purified by his intelligence and controlling the mind with determination, giving up the objects of sense gratification, being freed from attachment and hatred, one who lives in a secluded place, who eats little and who controls the body and the tongue, and is always in trance and is detached, who is without false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger, and who does not accept material things. Such a person is certainly elevated to the position of self-realization. One who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman. He never laments nor desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to every living entity. In that state he attains pure devotional service unto me. One can understand the Supreme Personality as he is only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness of the Supreme Lord by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my devotee under my protection reaches the eternal and imperishable abode by my grace. In all activities just depend upon me and work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all the obstacles of conditional life by my grace. If, however, you do not work in such consciousness, but act through false ego, not hearing me, you will be lost. senses, banish me forever from this weary world. Dear Redeemer, I bow to you by the reedy river, see you in the trees, gather you in the harvest, breathe you in the morning breeze. Soul shaker, shake loose my pride, turn me upside down, drown me in your foaming tide. 
Lord Sri Krishna, smiling coward of Vrindavan. Allow me entrance into your abode, but only as a speck of dust along your road, or a feather fallen from your proud peacocks, a drop of water in your ocean. Nothing grand may I be, but grand enough to live with thee. Krishna, 
Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Shripad Jagannath Das. Shripad Jagannath Das was born in Rochester, New York, in the early afternoon of September 11th, 1953. As a child, he experienced many spontaneous spiritual episodes centered around the realization of the reality of God, transmigration, and the soul. Jagannath is a student of the 5,000-year-old non-sectarian devotional yoga path. At 15, he began the serious practice of bhakti yoga, as taught by His Divine Grace, E.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, the foremost exponent of the science of self-realization in the modern world. 
Three years later, he travelled to London to personally study with his master after having spent time as a brahmachari or celibate student in a Tampa, Florida ashram under Pushta Krishna Swami. At 21, Jagannath travelled alone to India, living in the beautiful village of Mala, just outside Rishikesh and also in Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh. Following three years of intensive study and meditation, he made his way back to the United States. There, under his secular name of Jeffrey Giuliano, he became the internationally best-selling author of over 32 books and a thousand audiobooks, all on the subject of spirituality, yoga philosophy, popular music and culture. When he was 30, he took formal initiation from His Grace Swami B. H. Mangal Maharaj in Toronto, along with his wife Vrindarani Devi. Together they established a large country ashram, Krishna temple, food bank, recording complex and animal sanctuary in Lockport, New York. At the age of 40, however, Das began to slowly wind down his various business activities in order to fulfill the prophecy of his time in India and the wish of his spiritual masters that he helped spread the inspirational tenets of bhakti in the Gaudiya Vaishnav tradition everywhere. Jagannath then moved to Bangkok, where he became a popular film actor and in 2017 established an audiobook company, Icon Audio Arts, which he runs today with his young son, Eden Garrett Giuliano. They split their time between Thailand and India. We hope you enjoyed this Dark Horse Arts presentation. It takes two to tell the truth. One to speak, another to hear. Inner Lion Media. Thank you for listening.